pledge. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, this evening is uh, is our presentation on 2019-2020 proposed preliminary budget. Uh, I'll, I'll just say in advance, well, there's quite a bit of information uh, in this presentation. In fact, uh, not only are there budgetary uh, numbers, but there's also some context around. Uh, what the budget really substantiates. So as a, as a just a brief summary, uh, you know, this budget is designed to help us to build the mission and vision of the Methacton School District based on the core values as this in our strategic plan as shown here on, on the slide. We also have certainly have a strategic plan that was updated most recently in December. Uh, that information is listed on the uh, district website for uh, your review. We've had a number of different uh, planning meetings that help uh, guide the strategic plan and guide uh, some of the programs and services and uh, things that we do for our students here in the district. Our budgetary process, uh, we present a draft uh, proposed preliminary budget uh, and timeline uh, back in October. Uh, we uh, use a zero-based budgeting methodology. Uh, we budget uh, expenses and the account codes per PDE, LEA chart of accounts. Uh, so generally what that means is um, on, on, from a year-to-year -year basis, the uh, Department of Education sometimes recommends that certain expenditures uh, are put in different categories, so we will have a little bit of discussion about that, and we normally do on an annual basis. We'll, we provide a presentation that is consistent with the means of communicating matters uh, of school budgeting over time. So started just a number of years ago, 
we went ahead and uh, from the very first presentation to our last presentation, we have a slide in the back of the, uh, of the uh, presentation that, that outlines all the changes that occur over time. So that anyone, no matter what time they get involved in looking at the budgetary process, they'll be able to follow the things that have changed. We uh, provide a detailed summary information uh, to provide transparent uh, communications of facts and figures with context. And we included staffing information uh, for the first time uh, uh, in this presentation. In addition, uh, we have some general data that talks about the district being made up of two townships, Lower Province and Worcester. Those facts and figures are listed here on the slide. And it also highlights some of the very uh, you know, important supportive aspects of the district. Not only our home and school associations, but our booster organizations and our, our post-prom uh, committee. In fact, uh, it gives me great pleasure just to recognize post-prom is coming up on the 20th year. It's an outstanding uh, achievement uh, for, for a very good cause. Next, uh, this slide outlines the, uh, the high level of department structure. It talks about uh, the board of school directors that are elected, uh, the, the superintendent, and the directors and building principals. It talks about the enrollment in the district. This is the December 11, 2018 enrollment at 4783. It talks about some of the, uh, the data associated with the different demographics within the district. It also lists uh, the school buildings from our high school to our, our four elementary schools. It also outlines some of the major technology aspects of the district. Uh, not, not just recently, but probably going, going back about a number of about six years uh, under Dr. Sosnovic's uh, leadership. Uh, we've been able to bring things like smart boards into the classrooms, projectors, uh, Chromebooks, uh, a lot of, of, of different technology that allows for innovation to occur in the classroom with the help of our teachers. And here are some of the top four systems that are provided by the district. The Bethacken High School uh, educates grades 9 through 12. They have a strong core curriculum. Uh, with, the pro with the opportunities to explore various academic and vocational opportunities. We have a full range of school counseling services. We provide uh, state-of-the-art technology events, placement uh, programs in 22 courses. We have college-level dual enrollment uh, courses. We have access to over 25 extracurricular athletic opportunities and 31 school-sponsored activities. When we look at Methacton High School, we have about 1,500 students. We have about 122 professional staff, six administrators, and 28 support staff. Our performance data is listed here. Uh, you should know that Methacton High School students outperform almost all of their uh, our counterparts in Montgomery County uh, in terms of SATs and ACT uh, performance. That's, a, that's, a, 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 uh, that's attributed to the uh, excellent uh, parental uh, support and teacher support in, in this district. We can see that the Keystone Gates, uh, Keystone data uh, suggests that knowledge of biology and literature um, in back in high school outperformed uh, not only the county, uh, but also the state. Our Cole Intermediate School uh, houses grades, or educates grades seven through eight. Uh, the students provide a rigorous curriculum with course subjects in, in health and physical education, expressive arts, uh, music, family, consumer science, technology education. Uh, we have access to a variety of co-curricular programs, including yearbook, homework, club, band, orchestra, and chorus. We have access to 13 uh, district-sponsored extracurricular program, programs and athletic opportunities. <coughs> Our Cold Media School has about 756 uh, students, uh, 65 professional staff, two and a half administrators, and 19 and a half uh, support staff. Our performance uh, in this past 17-18 uh, school year is listed here. And please know that uh, come next week, Dr. Katona will be uh, getting much deeper into the performance scores of all of our uh, schools and all, and all of our grade levels and for all of the exams. Uh, so I'm going to, you know, not say so much about that here this evening, but we are extremely proud of it. Uh, Skyview Upper Elementary School educates group, uh, students in grades five and six. Our students are, are grouped into teams. Uh, the typical sixth grade day includes instruction in reading, English, math, science, and geography. And a fifth grade day includes uh, instruction in English, language, arts, math, social studies, and science. 
Each team is dedicated to a flex time throughout the six-day cycle, and uh, Skyview students have access, access to a variety of co-curricular programs, including band, orchestra, and chorus, and extracurricular programs, including after-school sports in grades five, uh, and student council. Skyview Upper Elementary School has about 770 stu students, staff of about 65, administrators about two and a half, and uh, sports staff of 22 and a half. Their performance scores are listed here, and they perform quite well as, as well. We look at our elementary schools. We have four of them. We have our elementary school, Eagle Hill, Woodland, and Worcester. They educate students in grades K through four with a half-day K program. Uh, the curriculum uh, at the elementary level includes English language arts, mathematics, science, social studies, art, music, health, and physical education, and library. And the elementary school students have access to a number of co-curricular music programs, including band, orchestra, and chorus. Uh, in addition, student council, homework club, environmental club, Spanish club, chess club, and a number of others. Arrowhead Elementary School has 396 students, 36 professional staff, and their performance scores are listed in this presentation as well. Eagle Hill Elementary School, about 409 students, 35 uh, professional staff, and their performance scores are listed here. In fact, uh, Eagle Hill Elementary school, school has been recognized uh, by the Department of Education uh, for a, an honor in, in, in student growth. And we'll be uh, sharing more with the public about that and the, the staff uh, in the coming weeks. Woodland Elementary School has 464 students, 42 professional staff, and their performance scores are listed here as well. And please know that this presentation, along with others being presented this evening, will be uh, loaded up on the district's website following uh, this evening's meeting. And Worcester Elementary School has about 418 students, uh, 33 professional staff, one administrator, and uh, 11 uh, support staff. And their performance scores are, are here in Houston as well. When we look at the overall PSSA uh, results, uh, proficient and advanced, uh, we see that in grades three through eight, um, in the fact, the school district, the county, and the state for ELA, math, and science, you can see how things break out. Uh, we also can tell you that uh, Dr. Catone in her presentation next week will also have rank scores, meaning how did the fact and rank in Montgomery County, with Montgomery County generally way outperforming uh, the rest of the state uh, in, in, in a more regular basis. Uh, so uh, we, we generally uh, are, are pleased with, with, some, with these scores. We know that there's some work that we need to do, and uh, we'll be uh, digging more into this uh, with Dr. Chichelman uh, next week. The budgetary timeline. With that, uh, it gives me a uh, great pleasure to turn the rest of the presentation over to Mr. Ricker, our Director of Business Services. Jim? <coughs> Budgetary timeline, we actually start back in September 2018. In November, we sent out information to the pro property committee as well as the departments and start seeking budget information and start pulling together all the information. January 9th, we presented the information to the finance committee, which gives the draft proposed preliminary budget. Tonight, we're given the full board a review of the draft proposed preliminary budget. Um, next week, we would, depending on which way we would go, We'd either pass a resolution to stay below the Act 1 index or we would seek exceptions to the Act 1 index. Um, the other dates are in the future. Ultimately, the May 14th and the June 19th are the two key ones, which would be the ones where we approve the budget for final budget for adoption in May 14th, 2019, and then June 18th, 2019, that'll be the special meeting to adopt the budget. This gives the tax collectors plenty of time to collect the information and get out the tax bills. I'm sure everyone's happy about but it does give them the time to get out of um, For that one in index acceptance this year, they're not eligible for either. Uh, the two that we really look at are the Peters and Special Education Fund. And at this point in time, based on the information that we use to go through these forms, there is no exceptions for us. Our revenue, about 67% comes from real estate taxes. About 13% comes from other state revenue, and 7.4% comes from the Act 511 occupational tax, and then another 6.06% comes from basic construction and operating subsidies from the state. The assumptions that we put into the budget this year, um, we 
have an affluent index of 2.3 this year. For this proposed preliminary budget, we have the affluent index at 2.29 to 8%. Uh, there's no special exceptions. We're using the assessment data as of 2000, November 2018, taking into consideration the Shannondale escrows, the previous year's tax revenue collections, level title funding, level basic education funding, and we increased our uh, interest rates to 2% on our CD and 1.75% on our bank investments. Uh, last year we got about 1% on the CDs and 0.1% to start the year. So that increases over time as the rates are going up. We added this uh, new slide here based on the finance uh, committee's request. This shows the revenue from the 2017-2018 actual 18-19 budget the initial budget for the 19 which is the preliminary budget, and then shows the changes between them. So with regard to the local revenue, we're looking at an increase of $2.8 million uh, from budget to budget, and $4.65 million from 17-18 to actual 19-20 budget. There obviously is a year gap in between them also. State and federal, we're going to have the federal revenue should be increasing by about a half a million, I'm sorry, the state revenue should be increasing by about a half a million dollars. Uh, that's directly from revenue from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And with regards to the federal, we're actually looking by the budget about a $45,000 increase. Um, that comes mainly from the uh, restricted grants and aid from the federal government. This is how the real estate taxes break out. We take the assessed value about $2.6 billion times 2.29 to 8%. That gives us a new millage rate. That gives us our first tax levy. Uh, there are no exceptions to factor in. There is no adjusted millage. It is the same as for an index. There is that homestead, the gambling offset, which is a $2 million. And then that gives us our net tax levy of $77,760,000. Right now, our collection rate is 96.01%, which translates into $74.7 million. This is the millage breakdown. Uh, basically, our, the average uh, assessed value in the district is $173,660. The increase results in an annual increase of $119.60. And here you see the different tables for the increases, and you can get the actual assessed values from Montgomery County's website. The proposed preliminary budget expenditures, salaries and benefits total about 68.4% of our budget. Uh, operating expenses, 22.4%, and then you have debt service, which is 9.34%. Each year, we have $200,000 that we do um, on building projects where we look to do different upgrades in the building outside of the normal work scope. These are more projects that each building has and wants to get done. Um, they range from a new PA system in our COLA all the way down to uh, a computer lab and a library. The capital reserve projects, and this is different than the one we discussed tonight, but those is the one that we presented at the Finance Committee. Um, so the capital project, I'm sorry, this is actually the capital project that we're going to be recommending for the uh, 1920 school year. So these are the capital projects. We have uh, buyout of leases for facility equipment. We have new equipment that's necessary to be bought. We have to rebuild the chiller at the high school. We have a lease buyout of $158,000 for technology leases. Uh, we have the high school library furniture for STEM. That would be the one on the prior budget slide that we group that would come out of that budget projects. Again, the budget projects back here will never exceed $200,000. This is just a preliminary starting list. Some of them also have to have the prices finalized. And then the last one is uh, $250,000 for our new phone system. Staffing needed for the district. Right now, there's been no change in the staffing that has been put into the budget. The staffing that was used for 1920 is the exact same staffing that we have currently for 1890. 
as changes occur <coughs> up, down, or redistribution of those, they'll be tracked here so that everyone can see the changes as they're occurring and it'll be logged for them. Staffing requests that are not in the budget right now. We have some part-time non-instructional assistance for our COLA, two at Skyview, non-instructional assistance, two at the high school full-time, uh, school counselor secretary at Skyview, teach one more teacher on assignment, a transition coordinator, and five PCAs. Again, none of these are currently in the budget, but they have been requested by the departments and the buildings. Assumptions on the expenses. Um, personnel costs, their increases are determined based on the contractual agreements that are in place with the school district. Healthcare on the consortium is based on the first of three books. Our medical increased by 7.08% and a prescription increased by 18.35%. Again, it's important to note the Act 1 is only 2.3 and we're already proposing a 2.2928% increase. Down on vision costs, we've been able to keep those flat for the school. No increase to the district or the uh, members. This includes costs associated with bonding, another six and a half million dollars at the end of this school year, and eight and a half million dollars each year thereafter for five years to address the facilities assessment. This is a five year projection of assumptions. The key thing being on the revenue side, and we project the Act 1 to be 2.3 for the next five years. Previously, a was used as a projection of the state. Uh, they were significantly off and much higher, so about 150% higher than what actually came out. We decided to be more conservative with the view of the future, and we kept the Act 1 index at 2.3% for each of the years following, which is the same as this year. Um, with regards to the expenditures, salaries and staff and labor agreements are 2%. Each year thereafter, the existing contract. Uh, I've already said about the first look of health care. And then the PISA rates are the numbers that are provided to us with PDE with the projection out for the next five years. So what's a five year projection look? So this is a five year projection with an increase in 2020 and no property tax increases in 2021 through 2024. As you'll see, in 2021, with no property increases, we have a negative operating balance of $2 million. This grows to $4 million in 2022, $6.7 million in 2023, and ends around $9.2 million in 2024. What this does to our unassigned fund balance, which is the money that we, use, that we have for spending for emergencies in the division, it will drop our unassigned fund balance over that time period to a loss of $14.7 million. Five year projection of the most primary budget, and we do the 2.3% property increases. There's still losses, as you'll see, but those losses are much more minimal. We have $267,000 in 2021, all the way to $1.8 million in 2024. In this scenario, keeping at, at the Act 1 index of 2.3, you'll notice that we still have an unassigned fund balance at the end of the five year term. So we've also been asked to provide five-year comparisons um, on where we actually were and how we finished. So you'll see the differences that we go through. The key ones up here is that you look at the budget for 2019 school year. That's the current year we're in. We have a $109.4 million budget and expenses. And we're looking to go to $112.6 million in 2020 school. Uh, we're currently at finishing the 2018 school year, 17-18 school year, with revenues of $106.8 million and expenses of $104.2 million. We also do a sensitivity analysis that the Finance Committee requested last year. This shows how the impact of the school district would be, depending on where the act one goes, if it increases up to 2.8% or if it decreases down to one. Five-year projection that shows staffing costs. Currently, the staffing cost goes from $46.8 million up to $50.7 million in 2024. The time goes from $19.5 million to $20.2 million. Insurance is at 10. This is the health care insurances. All the benefits associated with health care. 
$7.1 million to $12.2 million. And other employee benefits go from $645,000 to $650,000. Um, overall salary and benefits fall 68.4% of the standard budget as discussed before. And will stay steady at about a 68.2% by the end of 2024. Capital projects is shared the borrowings that we talked about. This is not include the six and a half million dollars that we're going to be borrowing, proposed borrowing this year. And it shares the eight and a half million dollars that we take out for all future years. Obviously, the model goes through five years of 2024, but we can extend that out. The borrowings actually would go to 2027. Top 10 expenditures that we have uh, professional salaries, retirement contributions. Redemption of the principal, group insurance, contracted carriers, administrative salaries, social security, professional services, interest, and professional medication coverage. When we look at the major objects, this is the codes that uh, Dr. Zerman was mentioning earlier with the account codes. 100 series is salary, 200 benefits, 300 is professional and technical services that are purchased. 400 property, 500 for other purchase services, 600 for supplies, 700 is property, and then 800 and 900 typically are the debt, and that's the interest and the principal is primarily in there. Lease payments also would be um, in there for other things, and then the technology lease would be in the 400 section. So salaries are, again, we already went through to 46.8 to 50.7. And we'll notice that the grand total of expenditures over this time period go from 12.6 to 125.6 million dollars. Typically, the end here would be a North Monaco Technical Career Center's comparison showing these different school entities. They have not all finished their budgets to get approved. Once that information is reported, we'll be adding that information in here for a comparison as to where we stand within that group. The decisions that have to come up. So, next board meeting, one of the decisions has to come up is to either go and exceed the Act Point Index or pass a resolution that we will not exceed the Act Point Index. Given the fact that we have no exceptions and that we are at a preliminary proposed budget of 2.298%, we're recommending that the board pass the resolution not to exceed the Act Point Index. That was Remove the requirement for the February 19th meeting, and then the action next steps will be the May 14th and the June 18th meetings. We have a lot of charts here to read. gives you the 2016 to 2018 actual expenses, 2019 the current year's budget that we're in, the preliminary budget for 2020, and the projected number for 2021 through 2024. And it is a large document that I think before we get the information out by each individual will be And that concludes my presentation. At this time, uh, we're going to ask the members of the board to uh, take their seats at the uh, table uh, for any discussion about the board of uh, our project. Gregor and I uh, presented uh, the, uh, the budget, uh, the proposed preliminary budget, and so Mr. Gregor talked about the timeline. Uh, there will be a number of steps that we commonly go through. So, for example, uh, well, we made a recommendation that we think that the board ought to uh, con uh, consider next week to adopt the resolution. 
stating that we will not go beyond the Act 1 index in, in taxation for the 1920 school year, please know that our work doesn't end there. Um, we'll, we're working with the Finance Committee as well as other members of the board. Uh, we'll be working internally as well to make sure that um, we refine um, our, our budget and get into a position that allows us to best meet the educational needs of our students here in the district and is fiscally responsible to our taxpayers. So with that said, I'll open the floor up to any questions from members of the board. Anyone down here? Uh, Mr. Bernshaw? I did just one question. Um, slide 34, which is staffing for the district by building, is that 1819 information, is that the budget? Just to clarify that. Um, that was provided by HR, that's our current staffing level, is that 1819? Actual or budget? Actual, actual. Any other questions from my left side? If not, to the right. Any questions from members of the board? Uh, Mr. Ryan. First, thank you to Senator Dr. Zerby for this. Um, I was at the finance uh, meeting uh, last week. Um, just two follow-ups here that I had was, um, I made a request and just for the board's uh, knowledge as well as the public, um, adding a slide for the uh, Act 1 military history going back just so we can see what percentage increases have been over the last you know, decade or 20 years, whatever it is, to see you know, how we got to the current point that we're at now. I'm actually trying to get that for the county, uh, so you have more competitive information, see how we're trying to get those also, but I definitely will have ours in the next update for not good finance meeting in February. Thank you. Um, and just one other comment regarding the, uh, the staffing numbers that we have here, and uh, the total amount that's built into the, uh, to the budget. Is that I would make the comment I made this once before that we might want to include some number based off of historical performance from the last you know, three year average of what attritional value we've seen throughout the year. Um, the number of staffing that we have at the beginning of the year is never the staffing that we have at the end of the year. Um, maybe we just put a little bit of analysis in there that I think that, that could help drive down the total tax increase number and in the knowledge that we would need. Um, just as another thing to look at. I know that Mr. Regina is looking for the, uh, is preparing, not looking for it. He's putting together the uh, 16, 17, and 17, and 18 uh, figures to add into this. So that we'll actually have the staffing levels at the end of each year. I understand he wants to see the beginning of the end and how they flow. I don't want that information to go, but I have to defer and shag on that. Well, thanks to both of you. Uh, any other questions on the budget? Just a, a small thing, thing. Uh, just to yeah. double check the arrowhead and the eagle, though I think you have the same uh, PSSA scores. And also on the Woodland, I'm not sure if the state score was correct, on PLA. Thank you. We'll take a look at that. Mr. Member? Yeah, just a couple of comments more than anything. I guess for the, the public's uh, benefit, a lot of the heavy lifting that goes into these budget presentations and the work happens in the finance committee behind the scenes. So I don't want you to take the, the lack of detailed questions here tonight for a, a lack of interest or lack of us digging into the details behind the survey. There's been a lot of other data that the committee asked for that uh, Tim and Dr. Derby have shared with us so far. Um, that will be additional questions and decisions over the coming months before we finalize this. Um, I do want to thank you, Tim, for all the work that your team has done on the revenue side of this. Um, being diligent about interest rates, making sure that we're staying on top of the banks, and uh, that is not an insignificant part of our $100 million budget. Um, it's also worth noting that slide 33, where we talk about master plan, where we talk about capital projects, those are separate from the master plan work that's going on for roofs and exteriors of buildings and, and the, uh, the other uh, eight and a half million dollars environment that Tim mentioned. Um, uh, can you, Tim, can you talk about, I guess for everybody's benefit, some of the changes that you made in the process over the last year as far as accounting and coding? Um, sure. I'll just give the, some of the highlights. So, first of all, one of the biggest changes that we did is we went through and started this year with budgeting that would actually look at 1718's actual and 1920's budget. What that does, it allows you to see the difference from previous would have been budget to budget. So if you budget $5,000 on one item, 
and you don't spend any money there, you're always going to be looking at budget funds. You would never know that you did not spend money in that category. So most likely we budget five thousand dollars again. So what we did is add an actual category in there. So you can see I had five thousand dollars budget. Well, I never would have spent anything on that. We really don't need that money. So that helped pull a lot of money out of the uh, departmental and the building budgets for the school district to eliminate some of the unused or unnecessary budget in the regards to that actually helped the operating values, which are relatively stable um, in regards to the increase from year to year. One of the other things we did is we started using the actual codes for where they are. Uh, and past business directors, they said, put the expenses where the budget is, which then just keeps creating the same error over and over again. So what we do is we put the we put the expenses where they belong and we move the budget so that when you budget the next year, budget you know where you need your expenses to be. You can actually have a better budget along with that. Um, we've had better discussions with the building principals with regards to the departments. I think some of the different ideas that we talk about the sharing and we go through that that that's all been very good and you know it's a teamwork from the building principals to the department heads. Everyone's really working and contributing and having me and trying to keep this as level as they can. Uh, thanks, Tim. I, the one other question that I had is, you know, we the but it would also be good to know, you know, as we go through this process, um, sort of you guys had to cut something to get to the index. It would be good for us as a board to know what kind of things got cut out of the budget as we went. I mean, certainly there was nothing major we would hurt about it, I assume. Um, but I think it's good for us to know what the decisions are being made and what things were uh, might be losing in, in the process. So every year I've got to keep cutting these expenses. Not necessarily keep up with everything. Yeah, so I, I think yeah, that, that plays into the part of that. You know, there's a number of things in this budget, or in this presentation, that I'm actually in the budget. And uh, our intent was, for example, ah! staffing. Um, we, we know that uh, you know, there, there may be some requests over here. Um, and we know that we, we might have some need, we might have some other ways to address those needs. The, the challenge for us and, and, and for us, for us, I mean, us all, the, all ten of us, is that uh, the budgetary process uh, is really one of those things about you know, what you have available and choices that you need to make. So I mean, uh, if, if for example the board decides that they, they want to pass the resolution not to raise taxes over the 2.3% uh, uh, one index, they will, we will then be locked in to not raising taxes greater than that, and therefore all the decisions we make about uh, planning for next year will be, uh, you know, couched into that that realm. Uh, so it will, it will be, you know, about choices about do we need these staff, do we need these staff, do we need these books, do we need these, these supplies, do we need to do these things, and and uh, it's really about choices. So. Over the next couple of months, we'll be having those discussions, and uh, we'll be sharing, you know, much more information. Thanks. Are there any other questions uh, on, the, on the budget presentation at this point? If not, um, I'm, and I don't like to do this, but we're going to ask the board one more time uh, to go to the seats. Uh, we're going to go on to the next presentation on the agenda, which is the Arrowhead Elementary School Options, Considerations, and Recommendations. So this evening, uh, I'm going to be presenting uh, to the board uh, some information that was partly requested by them and also uh, 
uh, needed for us getting to a, a decision uh, process. So this evening, uh, tonight's objective uh, to provide the information and make a recommendation to the board uh, for consideration at the uh, January 22nd, 2019 uh, voting meeting of the board. At a high level, in an effort to help everyone here and those that may watch afterwards understand in its most simplistic form how and why we are having this conversation, we knew that uh, from the facilities assessment study of 2016 that many of our buildings were in need of maintenance and major systems replacements. Ireland Elementary School was projected to need about $14 million in repairs. So after much discussion and information sharing and with the discussion uh, regarding uh, the potential of renovating Arrowhead Elementary School, constructing a new Arrowhead Elementary School, or closing Arrowhead and consolidating, tonight, in an effort to uh, inform and potentially take the next step towards narrowing the potential outcomes, the real question is, shall the Arrowhead Elementary School continue operating as an elementary school in the Methacton School dis District for the foreseeable future? Depending on how uh, the outcome of this response is from the board, we will either prepare uh, for a school consolidation hearing schedule and notify the public accordingly, or we will move forward with determining how Arrowhead will continue as a school in the future with future discussions, cost analysis, and the like. The agenda for this evening is to create context around the discussion, uh, not only for the board, but for members of the public. We'll be looking at community feedback, facility uh, study, uh, capacity clarification, enrollment projections, and on quota considerations. And then I'll go into options that uh, the administration has explored. We'll talk about uh, the projections and what that, what that looks like. We'll talk about cost considerations. We'll also talk about the educational benefits and other considerations if, in each of those uh, explored options. And lastly, I, I will make a recommendation to the board uh, for their consideration. Your mic's off. The light's red on your battery. feedback. Um, what does our community believe we ought to do? So we've been talking about this for a number of months and, and after my November uh, presentation uh, to the board, uh, we opened up uh, our, our email to, uh, to, to receive about 107 plus responses totaling about 496 plus pages of information from members of the public. Um, uh, and, and the the, uh, and those and those uh, responses are actually still coming in today, uh, which is interesting. Uh, I, I see over uh, almost about a dozen uh, response emails today. Uh, but overwhelmingly, the responses indicate that we should continue using Arrowhead Elementary School uh, as an elementary school in the district. When we look at the facilities assessment study, just so everyone understands what this study has done, they looked at evaluated all of our properties. And uh, in, in short, uh, the, the colored chart to, to the left of the slide uh, outlines each building and the totals that were uh, projected in need. In fact, uh, the, the total cost over a 10-year period is about $83 million, not including the Farina administrative building um, or the transportation buildings. In the, uh, in the center of this uh, presentation, when we talk about the work on, on the plan to date, uh, it's important for the public to know that the board has committed uh, a number of uh, resources, uh, about $8.5 million worth of resources in year one to address a number of issues, 
And in year two, we're already talking about a potential of about $6.2 million um, to, of, of work that is currently in bid preparation. And, and we're looking at uh, seeing you know, how those bids come in in the, in the very near future. All of these decisions surrounding the master plan and how work gets uh, uh, to the board for consideration and approval is outlined in the projected schedule listed on the slide as well. Uh, this schedule becomes important in the cycle of determination if the board were to consider any such outcome for the Arrowhead Elementary School. Capacity clarification. This conversation uh, regarding uh, plan con uh, capacity somehow has resurfaced. So I wanted to make sure that uh, both the board and the public understand the background and information and clear things up so that we can go forward. Basically, plan con is a school cons construction and reimbursement process designed by the state whereby certain actions are required in a multi-step process to become eligible for partial reimbursement of instructional space costs under a school construction project. While the plan con program has been frozen and underfunded for more than seven years, in, in the multi-step process, school architects leverage the available space to maximize the reimbursement for the school district. Furthermore, the plan con process does not take into consideration changes in the program delivery, types of programs, or technology or other changes that may occur after construction has ended. To use the plan con capacity as, as addressed, uh, the use of the plan con capacity was addressed two years ago when we were considering the potential closure of one or multiple schools. We wanted to share that the functional capacity is determined based on the homeroom eligibility size uh, classrooms and each building with consideration to the class size policy and administrative practices. So as an example here, uh, in, our, in our most recent documents, the plan con documents for Arcola and Skyview combined uh, has a capacity of 3,023. But when you when you look at the actual uh, full size uh, classroom uh, eligible spaces that uh, Dr. Angstad and the building principals have presented in previous meetings as well as almost two years ago, you will see that uh, it's it's much less than uh, the 3,023. And similarly to, for example, Worcester, the plan con capacity is 550 on the documents, but uh, it is, is a functional capacity of 448. So, so that we are aware going forward, administratively, we deal with the functional capacity uh, in an effective and efficient operation of schools. <coughs> It's important to remember that uh, we, back in November, uh, like we have done in, in just about every year since I've been superintendent, we've talked about full day kindergarten. And while uh, the board has not decided whether we will have four day, full day kindergarten or not have full day kindergarten, I believe it is critical for the board to consider full day kindergarten with respects to uh, planning for space in the future and also being aware that According to the chart here, uh, a majority of our colleagues in Montgomery County have full day kindergarten. With that said, that makes it uh, even more pressing for us to, uh, to consider. The board had asked uh, for additional information outlining the cost of implementing a full day kindergarten program. This slide simply shares some of those costs and details and outlines those costs. Uh, I'm not necessarily going to read through this entire uh, slide, but uh, it talks about the current cost of the full day or the half day program. And over to the right, it talks about some of the additional expenditures that are required. When well, we talked about some of the options going forward this evening, um, I think it's important to recognize that, that we, we had a, uh, an enrollment projection uh, completed. And as part of that updated enrollment projections, unlike in previous projections, there are 169 uh, single family attached units and 35 uh, single family detached units planned in the Arrowhead sending area. In addition, there are about 169 single family detached houses and 125 single family attached houses planned for the next five years in the Worcester sending area. 
These pipeline residential uh, projects are believed uh, to plan a, play a significant part in and challenge the district as it plans for the future use and consideration of these enrollment figures and the use of space and future directions and decisions. Our public considerations. I think it's important that, uh, again, the, the board had asked for information regarding our COLA. Uh, consistent with our discussions going back two years, the board has been informed that there is space in our COLA for another grade. While it can accommodate another grade, it would require the use of subspace in Skyview, as well as require other operational and programmatic changes that differ from how things are delivered today. So some of the bullet points on the slide here is uh, the top two. Uh, prior to Skyview, our call the facility educated grades 6, 7, and 8 with an average enrollment from 2006 through 2010 of about 1,282 students with a high of uh, 1,310 that occurred in 06, 07. Uh, based on the, uh, uh, on the options explored this evening uh, that depict future grade configurations in our COLA to include those three grades, uh, the enrollment uh, of those three grades is not greater than 1,132. And that includes uh, the pipeline projection uh, data. In 1999, prior to Skyview, the administration began work with resident associates on a $9.8 million expansion of our COLA, which became the eighth grade wing to address overcrowding in our COLA. So this, this wing uh, basically uh, was a 2-4 expansion that included 14 first floor homeroom uh, size uh, classrooms, three smaller office spaces, an eighth grade uh, cafeteria, now the Skyview cafeteria, and, the faculty and a faculty dining room. Uh, the second floor included 12 full homeroom size classrooms, two smaller office spaces. All of these rooms are now occupied by Skyview Upper Elementary School with the exception of the music rooms, they're shared, and the uh, uh, faculty dining area, which, is, which belongs to our polo, is currently being used for storage, uh, used as storage. Uh, all homeroom sized classrooms are now part of Skyview. This means that there are 26 full sized classrooms occupied at Skyview that were once part of the eighth grade wing. Scheduling in our COLA prior to Skyview, uh, our COLA operated with teaming in grade six and grade seven. Grade eight did not team, and, uh, and, but they do team today. And busing picked up and drop off. This is probably one of the more challenging uh, conversations about if we were to uh, put another grade, like sixth grade, into our COLA, uh, the busing pick up and drop off, drop off occurred in the front and the back of the building. Uh, with those three grades. Uh, there were three grades uh, with one bus tier uh, with different eight specific needs and programs. So to give you an idea, um, on that campus right now, there are four grades. And generally speaking, uh, the, the music programs are highly participated uh, and have participated in a different way uh, in grades uh, five and six than they are in seven and eight. And uh, there are also you know, participation in music and in other uh, activities in the elementary school, like grade four, is nearly about 100% of the students um, in each of those, in, in that grade. So when we talk about the, the, uh, the challenges of putting another grade on, on this campus, uh, the administration is highly concerned about how we would manage traffic flow of the busing and, and uh, deal with uh, providing for a safe uh, uh, environment on that campus. So that is a, a serious concern for us. The next uh, slide uh, talks about uh, the, uh, the options. There, there, we explored six options. Um, you'll notice that um, we use some color to uh, provide some, some context about around some areas that uh, are of high concern and are areas of caution. And so when, when we did that, I want you to understand, before we go to those numbers, you understand what those, those numbers mean. So when, we, when you see something that's highlighted in red, it's uh, highly concerning, and it exceeds the recommended utilization buffer of 90%. When you see caution, it's approaching a utilization buffer of 85% to 89.9%. So in applying these factors, the, the utilization uh, buffer, 
uh, and effective utilization provides for a consistent basis for adhering to class size policies, at the same time creating a buffer for natural fluctuations in the size of cohorts and for typical inefficiencies in the use of classroom space. So the, the first option is the current schools, current number of schools, all seven buildings, and uh, this current grade configuration. And just bear with me so that uh, you understand uh, where these numbers are, are coming from. So all the numbers uh, related to the projections come from the pipeline projects uh, uh, chart uh, provided by Milo and the groom, the vendor that had two years ago been our uh, vendor of choice. Uh, for providing uh, enrollment projections. And you will see here that there are a number of columns, and I just want to explain them. Obviously, the schools are listed here. The functional capacity, which I spoke about uh, just earlier, and, what, and I spoke about what that meant. We talk about the, the enrollment on a particular uh, day, or uh, of year, or year. So this is, this is the enrollment that was projected for uh, 2018. And it's actually slightly under what we actually have today. Uh, this would be the utilization based on the functional capacity and the projected enrollment for October 1, 2018. In the next uh, section, this is about five years out, and it also looks at October 1 projections and the year 22-23 utilization. It shows you what that utilization would be of space in each of these buildings. And then lastly, it talks about 10 years out and what the utilization of space is. So as you can see, by year 10, if we do nothing and we want to continue with Worcester as it is and do make no changes, uh, we are likely to be dealing with uh, 120, almost 121 percent uh, over uh, uh, functional capacity at Worcester Elementary School. So when you see red, uh, these are things that are certainly are highly concerning uh, and, and uh, and, and, and yellow means that they're 85% or, or greater. So the things that are inherited with the decision and are things that certainly need to be watched. So again, this is just an example of what our configuration would look like today if we made no changes whatsoever. So no changes to space, no changes to buildings, no changes to grade configurations. So some of the challenges here, obviously, uh, and, and each option comes as a set of challenges and benefits. Um, they are pared down to be the most important things for the board to consider. There are a number of other ancillary matters that need to be considered, and uh, both on the benefit and uh, challenge side. But the challenges of option A is a phase in of redistricting, and new construction is required to accommodate uh, the full day kindergarten program. So if we wanted to do full day kindergarten under this particular option, uh, it is likely that, uh, as you can see at the elementary levels, uh, we'll likely need a, a, a new construction at, for example, Arrowhead uh, to accommodate a phase-in of the uh, redistricting over time. And what phase-in means, uh, just so people understand that, is uh, imagine, imagine, you know, my fist is, is the sending area right now for Arrowhead, uh, where students in half day K through grade four are, are attending, is the attendance area. Uh, what the phase in would say is after, after looking at the, at the potential uh, population shifts and how we need to deal with uh, full day kindergarten, there might be a finger or two expansion of uh, full day kindergarten enrollment. So the kindergarten students might be coming from another neighborhood or coming from another, a couple neighborhoods that are adjacent to the existing uh, 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 setting area. And so what would happen is the students uh, would be phased in through uh, redistricting over time. So it would not interrupt students that are currently in the grades if, they were, if we were to choose that option. Uh, and the only other major consideration with a phase in would be sibling uh, matters. And we'd have to you know, take those and, and consider those. Uh, but that's, that's to give you an idea of how that would, that would work in this. Um, it, requires a, it certainly requires a minimum of, of the, uh, of the uh, renovations as outlined in the facilities assessment, and it does limit our opportunity for full day kindergarten and innovative programming without new construction of the Iowa Elementary School. Under benefits, it preserves our neighborhood schools and the current cohesive parental involvement. Uh, it preserves an opportunity uh, for, for full day kindergarten and innovative programming in the district uh, under the new construction scenario. 
another benefit. It preserves existing programs, practices, and services. And there's really no educational programmatic interruption for the students, parents, staff, or the community. And option B, option B is three elementary schools uh, with the current grade configuration. Uh, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. Uh, again, we explored a number of, of options. Some are more, we'll call it reasonable than others. Um, but what we tried to do is make sure that uh, there was no door left unturned in terms of uh, the considerations. But as you can see here, uh, even, even in the first year, you would, you would be over capacity in, in all the remaining elementary schools. Uh, and it doesn't get any better going out. And again, this is with, with uh, Arrowhead closed, students redistricted, uh, no great configuration changes uh, in the district. Obviously, there's a number of challenges. I won't necessarily go into all of these, but um, it, it will require uh, forced teacher transfers for the second time in a short period of time. Uh, it'll be redistricting all elementary students for a second time in less than the recommended 10-year period. Uh, limits our opportunity for full-day kindergarten. Um, it requires transition of students currently in grades K through four in the initial year. And uh, some of the benefits, it has a cost avoidance of a $14 million in renovations to Arrowhead, among other. There might be some potential revenue uh, from the sale of Arrowhead, uh, which would be one time uh, revenue, or some moderate uh, community benefit if it was reused for some uh, community use. Option C, this option is three elementary schools and Skyview in a great configuration of K through five and Arcola in a great configuration of six through eight. So again, here are the list of the schools. You can see Arrowhead, uh, when, when Arrowhead is not listed, that means that it's been closed and, it's, and there's been a consolidation. You will also notice here that there's now an increase in the number of students attending Arcola. Uh, you'll notice in the first year, uh, the numbers are, are, are highly approaching the, uh, uh, the uh, Realization uh, a buffer with one surpassing the utilization buffer. By year five, if you make if this is the decision you want to go with, by year five, you already have three buildings uh, out you know in jeopardy on the utilization buffer and two on the verge. Uh, and ten years out, I mean it's it, it's certainly uh, challenging as well. Uh, and you'll notice for each of these options, we also listed at the bottom some of the cost projections. So this this really would require renovations at Skyview and the Arcola campus. So when I spoke about uh, you know, putting another grade here, I'm talking about the campus. I mean, we need to reconfigure the campus in order to address uh, the traffic flow and, 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 and so forth. Uh, but it also requires some changes to the Skyview building. So in this example, uh, because K would be added here, we typically have bathrooms for our, all of our kindergarten uh, classrooms. Uh, we would likely have to uh, construct not only uh, bathrooms for kindergarten, but also playground facilities, uh, which would also take up, that would start taking up additional parking space and, and challenges with the, with the whole campus as well. So that's uh, option C. Option C comes with a number of challenges. I'll try to address them the best I can. Um, it, it does fracture the neighborhood schools. It disrupts at least some parent involvement, and it, and it may influence home values. Uh, you know, seriously, uh, you know, Arrowhead being one of the areas where uh, there's planned construction, uh, likely the school would close there. It may not necessarily send the, the, the proper message. Uh, doing a building where we have three elementary schools that have about 400 students in them, and then having what we call a mega elementary school in Skyview would create a dissimilar building transitions among all of our four elementary uh, schools. Uh, we have some challenge with the, uh, the alignment of resources, and, and please know that in this, uh, in these settings, because there's so many things that I wanted to share with the board and the public, when you see a capital letter in the middle of the sentence, it really means that it's another thought. Uh, I could not find a way to fit all this stuff on onto one slide. So I, mean, I just want to you to understand this is not a grammatical problem. It's really uh, a way to get space and be able to actually read it. So there'll be scheduling challenges and there's contractual challenges with option C. Uh, again, forced teacher uh, 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 transfers, 
for a second time in a short period. We'd have to revisit all the elementary students for a second time in less than a 10-year period. And let me, let me just speak about that for a second. So our recommendations from uh, my own and McGroom has been doing you know, enrollment projections and redistricting uh, uh, work for uh, more, than, more than 10 years. Um, they have they, they have recommended to us uh, back two years ago that you do not want to redistrict uh, if you certainly don't have to uh, within less than a, a 10 year period. Uh, the, the disruption to the community is, is very challenging. Uh, teacher certifications and degree assignments uh, will, will challenge teacher retention. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's possible that some of our certifications might not line up properly, which would mean that there, there might be some teachers that have been with us for a period of time that would not necessarily uh, find uh, a home with us with, through a consolidation like this. Um, and I'm not going to read all, all, all of these. Uh, there's a Canvas reconfiguration with Skyway Road to try to address the congestion, uh, safety, and traffic flow and busing. Uh, we have special education program relocation of two classrooms. We're not sure exactly where they'll go, but we know they won't fit um, at these locations. And uh, again, uh, uh, technology resources will have to be adjusted. There are some benefits. Um, in doing something like this uh, in option C, it improves our utilization overall by 6.5%. <coughs> We'll have a cost avoidance of uh, $14 million because you wouldn't have to renovate uh, Arrowhead, but there's likely to be other costs that we haven't been able to even estimate yet because you know we, we haven't gotten serious about these particular options. And, and there might be some one-time potential revenue for the sale of, of Arrowhead for modern community uh, use. Option D, uh, this, this option here talks about uh, three elementary schools, K to three, <coughs> and uh, Skyview grades four through five, and our coal is six through eight. And uh, though the high school hasn't been shared a lot here, it was clear from my conversations with the board in the public meetings that high school, no one was interested in eighth grade going to the high school. So please know that the high school is purposely left off this discussion process, um, even though uh, you know there, there might be some you know consideration about seventy five percent of utilization, but. Um, you know, it's not a part of any of our options. So in this, uh, three elementary schools, K through three, Skyview four and five, uh, our COLA six through eight, um, you, you'll see, again, uh, in the first year, this is what would, this is, these are our challenges. Uh, the challenges remain almost uh, consistently in years five, and then by year 10, uh, you know, we have, we're about 100, we're about 21% over uh, what War System can, can handle. So cost projection requires renovation to the whole Skyview campus and each of the remaining elementary schools, uh, either by you know, putting modulars in or, or doing after the uh, classroom construction. Uh, option D has some challenges and benefits listed here. Again, fractures in neighborhood schools, disrupts the police and parental involvement, influences home values with the uh, 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 closing of another building. Uh, schedule changes. Many of these are similar to uh, option uh, C that, that we previously looked at. Uh, it limits our opportunity for full day kindergarten and innovative programs district wide. See, I think one of the important parts to remember is while, while it, it, it may seem uh, uh, you know, more efficient to have a higher uh, utilization rate, uh, the higher utilization rate uh, you know, challenges uh, the administration and our staff in providing you know, flexible spacing and needs and, and addressing needs in a, in a flexible manner for our students. So again, that really goes back to the, to the whole uh, buffer uh, discussion, uh, which Milan and the groom uh, you know, brought forward uh, nearly two years ago. And staying consistent with that, that's why I think it's important for you to at least understand that as we're approaching the utilization uh, buffer maximum, uh, that, that part of that factors into your decision. In this particular scenario, this will require transition of students currently in grades three, four, and five, and seven. And why seven? Well, because if we go into this configuration, um, the, the schedule for eighth grade is, is going to you know, dramatically change. And students, uh, if, if we do what we did in the past, are likely not to be teamed. 
Uh, if we decide to team them, it's going to require uh, more staff to be involved in that process, which would increase our, our overall cost of that implementation. However, on the benefits side, again, uh, we can see uh, an approximately 6.5% overall district-wide increase in EP utilization. Uh, we can have a cost avoidance for the uh, Arrowhead uh, renovations. Uh, we have moderate uh, community benefit, uh, it provides moderate grade span alignment, and provides some moderate improvement in consistencies uh, of programming and professional development as well. Option E. Option E is three elementary schools, K through four, Skyview, K through four, and all of five, and Arcola, six through eight. So this is just a, 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 another configuration that um, isn't necessarily popular with the administration, um, but it is, it is a conceivable uh, scenario that um, one might think could work if, you, if you're playing just solely with numbers and, so, and using students as, as widgets to see where they fit in the best place. So with that, um, you can see the buildings, the functional capacity, and how that might play out again uh, in the first year, the fifth year, and in the uh, tenth year. Uh, obviously, renovations of the campuses uh, and the elementary schools will, will likely be needed. Option E, uh, again, some of the same uh, challenges, specifically due to the uh, you know consolidation. Um, this here will create another uh, you know, transition problem for uh, students and uh, a number of other things. So for example, it requires transition for grades K through all K through four, five, and seven. So there's, there's, a, there's a number of disrupt, disruptions that are going to be occurring in option E. Again, it improves our, our district-wide uh, utilization by about six and a half percent avoids the arrowhead uh, renovations and has some of these other moderate uh, improving, uh, benefits. The, uh, the last option, uh, the last option is, is four elementary schools, K to three, Skyview four to five, Arcola six to eight. So if you look at this one, um, you, the one thing you might notice is that there's a lot less red on this particular slide than there are on uh, some of the, the previous options. Yeah. And that doesn't necessarily uh, make this option uh, the best option or the one that the administration most prefers. It, it's just something that you ought to recognize. And so when you look at this, uh, you can see that uh, you know, in the first year to, uh, to, uh, to implement this, uh, things look uh, reasonably well. Uh, by year five, things look reasonably well, and uh, there seems to be some challenge back out in, uh, in October of 2027. This will require renovations at Arrowhead, and it will uh, require renovations to the Skyview Arcola campus. Uh, it won't necessarily require, it could also require, uh, depending on how the recess is designed um, for Skyview, it might require also to have a uh, a play area for recess. So this particular uh, scenario, uh, again, uh, will we increase uh, utilization and capacity uh, and, and is predicated on information of full day kindergarten. So, so this here uh, scenario does provide us some room uh, for uh, moving forward with full day kindergarten. Uh, requires alignment of resources, scheduling changes, uh, maybe some contractual uh, challenges. Um, it, it does limit some of the, uh, uh, the teacher force transfers. Um, school day start and end time adjustments are required. Um, there, there's an impact to grade the students currently in grades three, five, and seven in the initial year. Um, and it limits common planning areas for teachers. Um, challenges with technology resource uh, implementation and an allocation that preserves our neighborhood schools at the current cohesive parental involvement, uh, provides an opportunity for full day kindergarten and innovative programming district wide, provides a moderate uh, grade span alignment, no redistricting required, and uh, it has a grade span uh, that allows for greater alignment for state standards and instruction practices. So that ends the information on the options. 
And considering all the information that we we provided the board and the public over the, the last couple months, and taking into consideration the educational factors, the financial factors, and the community factors, uh, my recommendation is as follows: that for, that a resolution be passed for January on January 22nd, and it reads as follows. The Board of School Directors have determined that there is a need to address the information contained in the 2016 Facilities Assessment Study of all these facilities and where this same study projected a needed investment of $14 million. I just want to be clear that the original uh, assessment was about $12 million and uh, the, the Board asked for our current uh, clerk, clerk of the Works uh, project managers who are with us here this evening, uh, Padavia, to to reevaluate re that to make sure that there weren't any um, unneeded improvements on that list. And after the reevaluation and the recosting, it, it is a $14 million uh, renovation project that, that is now uh, being considered. So I wanted to be clear on that. Into the Arrowhead Elementary School in the next three to five years, and where the Board of School Directors reviewed and considered all available information and have determined that with the projected scenarios presented by the superintendent, that the Arrowhead Elementary School shall continue to operate as an elementary school in the Medacton School District. Huh. With that, uh, I'm, uh, that ends my presentation, and I'll ask the board to take the seats at the, uh, at the table. Thank you. So, so, and, 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 
part, I made it perfectly clear that education is the, my first priority. I don't, ha I don't have to feel badly for the taxpayers because I am looking out for them as well. Um, so I appreciate all of the thought and work that went into to this. It isn't just, okay, let's go. There's been, a, been years. Um, it started back before Audubon. And Audubon was a very difficult decision. And we did, we closed Audubon so that we could keep education as close as we could to as wonderful as it is. And for those that are unaware, um, and for those that sometimes accuse us of not looking out for others and only looking out for the people at that, this table, that's not true. Because many of the children of the people up here were affected by that closure. But the bottom line is that all the children at the Facton are receiving a superior education. And I, for, have no questions. I appreciate all the information that was given. And I hope that the resolution passes next week. Uh, to my left, are there any other questions uh, from members of the board? Uh, Mr. Uh, first, thank you for pulling all this information together. Um, and if anything on the asking board has already been provided, just let me know how to find it. Um, first question I have relates to slide number seven, which is the capacity clarification. Um, are you able to provide to us how these numbers are calculated, like what the assumptions were in both plan con and the functional capacity regarding number of hunger eligible classrooms times number of students that would be put into those classrooms. Yes, so we'll end up, uh, well, plan con, I, I'm not an expert in plan con, okay, so I'd have to, I, I didn't provide that uh, to the board uh, how they do their calculation, but I can get that. So that's one thing that, that, that I have not provided. but. For the functional capacity, uh, Dr. Angstead uh, stood here before us, I believe, in December and talked about the home room eligible spaces. So that, that, that comes from the slides, okay, I'm yeah. gonna find that. All right, now I'm gonna go back to the story. Thank you. Um, if you could get plan time just to sort of compare, I, I can trace, that would be helpful. Yeah, I can trace that. Yeah, that's fine. Um, and then with respect to the full day kindergarten, Am I correct that that would require an additional eight classrooms based on what? So we take the current eight and just double it. Slide number nine. I'm not making an option recommendation this evening. I think what, what is clear to me and what's clear to my administration is that um, all these options indicate that there is a need for the building. Now, with that said, I think um, if the, the, the board decides similarly uh, to our recommendation in terms of keeping the building, then I think we need to then further explore uh, these options. I think that it's important as, as we talk about a decision-making process that we don't combine all the things at one time. Uh, so if we are going down, if we decide that we're going to pass that resolution and we're going to consider the building, then we got to you know dive into uh, more of the, of the details associated with each of these options. 
some some are really not uh, reasonable. Okay, so you know, <coughs> them, but they're there, um, and and I think it's important that um, while some appear to be more favorable than others, uh, I would like the time to be able to provide that recommendation after some more further uh, consideration. But it would require us to look at a number of things. I think the board would need to know uh, what what does it really take to deal with the uh, alignment of, of, of the, of the Skyboat Hall campus. I don't know yet. We have on the agenda this evening, uh, as a reviewer for David, we'll talk a little bit about that, about some of the uh, traffic study work that we're looking to do, not only on the high school campus, uh, but it, which isn't related to this issue, but also on the Skyboat Hall campus. Um, that might give us some indication of, of what we can do, what we might not, like, might not be able to do, even though, you know, administratively think that we can make it work. Um, there's just things that we don't know, like, you know, the rules associated with the construction and, and, and the right of ways and all that kind of, of, of things. So we would we'd have to have that work done. I think it's probably important for the board to uh, consider then uh, the other option is do you renovate Arrowhead or do you build Arrowhead? And I think that's a separate uh, conversation as well. And I think that's going to likely, you know, generate some expense. And what I mean by that is it's likely going to require to have a professional, you know, not give you a, a, a you know, a I got a T cross type of proposal, but you need more than what we, we originally had provided in terms of an estimate based on square footage that somewhere in the neighborhood of $25 million. That, that, that's not fair for the board to try to make it a consideration. Um, and we, we, if we were going to build new, we would have to talk about you know, we build it new with the same exact square footage, are we going to build new with more square footage, are we going to have this, are we going to have that, so there's a, there's a lot to play in this, and, and I would be, uh, I would be leading the board down the wrong path by wanting to combine all these decisions in the one. So my recommendation this evening is to, uh, that, that we need to consider Arrowhead uh, as, a, as a school, elementary school going forward, how that is configured, and how that, and whether we uh, renovate or build, is still a decision for the board that, that will require more information. Okay, that's, that's fine. The reason I asked the question was mainly because I have a concern on option A. Right now, the utilization of our COLA is south of 60%, and it stays there through even 2027 based on these projections. So yep. that's, that's something that we need to be addressed. Um, and then with respect to options B through E, um, where Arrowhead is no longer in the mix, you identify one of the benefits of the cost of winds of 14 million, which is capital spending. Has there been any quantification of the annual operating cost savings under those options? Uh, it, it, would, it would depend on the option that, that, that is there. It would, be it would depend on the, uh, the staffing uh, reallocation that would occur and, and certification. So, you know, it may, it may actually uh, uh, fluctuate, but I, I, don't, I don't have that number. And that's all. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from um, to my left? If not, I'll go to right in the back. Okay. I just want to reiterate how much I appreciate all of this information that, that you've distilled here. Um, we've been discussing the Arrowhead property for quite some time now. Um, quite a good bit this school year, but um, th this conversation in some form or another has been going on um, pretty much since I've been on the board for the last three years. So um, to take all of the, the information that has been requested over, over time and um, information that's been provided to the district and to distill it down to, um, to something that is pretty well digestible um, was, was no easy task and I appreciate the work that went into it. Um, and I, along with, with Ms. Rees, um, would support passing that resolution next week. Um, I, I don't see a scenario that is, is remotely feasible that, um, that would involve a closure of Arrowhead, and I, I just, I would not be able to support any sort of an option that would involve that. Are there any questions from members of the board to my right? I just, I uh, just wanted to say thank you for um, all the information. <coughs> Excuse me. Especially, um, I understand through just personal contact, you have spent a 
um, time asking important questions within our polo about space utilization and things like that. So I do appreciate the time that was invested in this. And, um, you know, I, I do think, as with Ms. Reese and Ms. Alvarez, that um, I would be in support of the resolution next week. Mr. Ryan. Uh, thank you again for the presentation. Um, a lot of this we've seen over the past months and going on a year or more at this point. Uh, I do want to say a special thank you to slide number 11, the Arcola considerations. Um, this got into a lot more of, you know, this isn't just a numbers game, what did it look like before, what was the programming. So I think that this was information that was asked for and I appreciate the response here. Um, I would also say that for, uh, this is just a little note for option C, just for those that go back to this, um, maybe online or in the future. <coughs> the first slide, slide 17, says three elementary schools in Skyview K-5. But on slide 18, it's a different title at the top of four elementary schools, K-5. So if you look at the two names on there, you might be confusing. Maybe you just correct that to be the same. Yeah, I, I think, uh, it, we, I can tell you that it was originally four elementary schools, K through five. It, it's, the, number, the numbers are the same, the but same. I, tried to, I tried to correct that, and, and I obviously missed one. Okay, thank you. Um, it was just trying to make it more consistent. I, I won't go on longer. I actually agree with a lot of what uh, Ms. Reese said. I think that you know, she was very on point with a lot of her comments there. Um, I did have a question for, if we get to the point in these options, yeah, for option D as an example here with Skyview at four or five. I think you briefly touched on this, but did you just explain a little bit more? Would that school then operate as more like the existing Skyview now on the five, six, you know, would teaming occur then for fourth grade? Or would that school kind of revert back and fourth and fifth would be more like an elementary school? I'm just curious what the program that that school would kind of look like moving forward. I don't know if that's a better question for you or Dr. Katona. We have, uh, well, clearly we haven't had full conversations about that. Um, I would I would think that we would probably look at something like it would still be an upper elementary, I think. Um, but with, because again, when you think about the grade configurations and even how the state looks at the grade configurations and that the K-3 is, is you know, more of the, the primary, you know, type level and then four or five gets more inter into intermediate. So I would imagine that it wouldn't be, you know, probably all out teaming, you know, like we see at our polls certainly, but, you know, maybe a couple teams of two or, you know, something along those lines. But again, we haven't had those conversations yet, so I couldn't say for sure. Yeah, so I guess I'll just, I'll end in closing that um, I do support the, the resolution that you have recommended here for January 22nd. Um, thank you again for all the work that's here and, but, you know, a lot more questions down the road in terms of, you know, the $14 million revised number that's there for Arrowhead, what that really means, um, and then, you know, what the uh, rebuilding option would be. So, thank you very much. Any other comments from uh, my right, Mr. Williams? Yeah, and that also, uh, reiterating the thanks to the administration on uh, putting this together in, in pretty succinct form. Um, it does raise some other questions, and I actually um, was probably not really thinking that the resolution is, but I think it gets me closer. I'd like to absorb more of it and I didn't consider what I would, would want to do next week. Um, I just wanted to uh, point out it does bring a lot of opportunities for us, the full day kindergarten, uh, either in a phased in approach or not, is something that we need consider uh, from a competitive nature and more importantly from an educational benefit for uh, both Providence and Worcester. Um, so that, that give the flexibility of having uh, having an elementary school and, and doing something with the sizing uh, with a K-3 configuration if that's and ends up where we're going. So that, that is very appealing. Um, the class size in elementary school uh, classes uh, we have pushed the envelope a little bit on our uh, policies the, and not really beyond our envelope, but we're pushing it. Um, and I would almost like to see the potential to invest on those class sizes going in the other way. Um, so that, again, provides an opportunity and more flexibility for the educational benefits. Um, it does also provide some concerns, um, 
specifically the eighth grade teaming uh, aspect of a 6-8. Uh, again, and I think you, uh, as Mike said on page 11, describe what it was. Um, I think it's important to point out that in 1999, the administration began working with on a $10 million expansion for eighth grade to address the overcrowding at our poll. Um, and that was around a 1,300 or so high of students in 2006, 2007. And if you point out that the 6, 7, 8 projected enrollment would be about 1,100 on the high side. So it, it fits without an, over, an oversizing, but it also changed the educational aspects of the ARCOLA. So it's something to absorb and understand. And also that raises up the contractual requirements for doing that. Um, so that, that is uh, certainly a significant aspect of that. Um, Obviously, there's a cost associated with this, is balancing, as uh, many have said before me, the balancing the education requirements and the spending requirements. Um, the other part, that, the only part that I just, uh, I think, Dr. Pintona put on a little bit, the only thing I'm missing a little bit is uh, the recommendation from a configuration from an educational perspective. It, the, I, I understand the resolution's not really going there yet, it's uh, the next step. But if K-3 is the right thing to do, I would like to know why it is and what the benefits of it is versus a K-5 versus a K-4. Um, you know, what does that mean in the, in the middle grades? It's harder and harder to spy view on our COBA side for students to go. What does that, moving them into those grades earlier, does that have a downside? Yeah. And, and a little bit around that uh, would help me. But again, I, I think it's moved us a lot closer to closing this down, so I appreciate it. Yeah, certainly, Mr. Winters, um, you know, having that conversation about the, the benefits of these configurations is really a, ne a next step. I mean, we, we've had we've had some preliminary discussions about that, but but until we get uh, serious about are we going to keep Arrowhead as a building, now we, if that's if that's what it turns out to be, then we can get serious about what the configurations would look like and have a, deep, a deeper conversation as a, as a board. Uh, with the public on those on those configurations, because I think that, that's just another step in the, in the decision making process. And uh, you know, trying to put it all into one thing, you know, I mean, there's no there's no major there's there's no major hurry on, on, on dealing with that. I think we need to, you know, uh, put it together uh, properly, uh, share it out, have conversations, and take it, uh, you know the next step uh, if, if, if if one presents itself on the 22nd. So thank you for your comments. Anyone else? I'm sorry, anyone else? I have nothing to say. I have nothing to say. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Come on, let's be real. Um, I, I do want to thank you. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I have no words, right? Um, I do want to thank you, honestly, for such a detailed look at the capacity information, which is something that we've been asking for. And I think this is clearly the most detailed analysis that we've seen of capacity in each of these buildings. I love the way that you went and actually took it took us five years out and ten years out to see what these buildings look like in ten years. And I think you know the short sightedness of, of previous boards has been their downfall and has hamstrung us in this process. Um, I, I think I'll speak for everybody up here when we say we we don't want to fall prey to that same Problem. So thank you for one, looking forward, and two, the work that you did to give us all the data. And, and honestly, what I see is that it confirms a lot of what we, those of us who are familiar with the schools, intuitively know. We're starting to get crowded in the elementary schools. We know there's room in our cola. But the question is how much and where and how do we do it? And I think that the way that you laid out these, uh, these scenarios, I think, makes it quite clear that as a district, we cannot afford to close that building. We cannot afford to close an elementary building. Um, I have a number of detailed questions that, that build on what Mike and, and, and Paul and Andrew and Kim and everybody else has said. Um, but there'll be a time for those discussions later when we start talking about the relative costs of each of these options, right? The $14 million that we're talking about is only a repair cost. It doesn't necessarily make a better building or a better environment in Arrowhead. Um, Anything that we do, if any great reconfiguration that would put more students on the sky to our Coley campus is going to require some level of capital improvement, not just for a playground, but for how we move traffic in and out. I mean, those of you that have been, been in the car line at our Coley, that have been there after school to pick up your kids, that have 
they have that have come in in the morning. It is an absolute nightmare there now, and, and trying to increase the capacity of that or the number of students on that campus by 25% is a, is a tremendous challenge. Not, maybe not necessarily within the building, but certainly outside the building. Um, how do we do that and still maintain adequate facilities um, within the building for the athletic fields that are outside the building? There's a ton of questions that have to be asked. Um, I'm thankful we'll be on the property committee that we can, we can tackle a lot of these. Um, my recommendation would be that we, we start to narrow down scenarios very quickly so that we can move forward um, and start to capture some of these benefits. I think I'd like us to come out of this with a plan, excuse me, um, that, you know, as you said, puts full day kindergarten on the map for some point in the future when our capacity can handle it. And we have a plan that we're going to execute over the next two, three, four years to get us to that point um, where we have the capacity and we have the financial capability to do it. Um, so thank you again for all the effort that you and your staff um, I'm sure you were bothering a lot of teachers and, and, and administrators in different buildings to get all this information, but I look at this piece of information as, as, as the capstone on what has been a three-year long effort. Um, and I'm thankful that maybe we're headed to finally ending this. Thank you. Any, any further questions on, on the presentation? No, but I feel like I'm, I will need to comment as well. So just so everyone has a few, I do believe um, we need to strive for educational excellence. I do believe we should be competitive around this area. I agree with everyone with all your statements. Um, I'm glad, to see, I do think with this pipeline and the projects coming, we have an, an influx of numbers coming in. Um, so I do thank you for all your hard work, getting all this together now and in the past. And I do support passing the resolution next week. So thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, I just I just want to say that I read all of the emails that came in to the board um, around this decision, and I took notes on each one and I categorized it. Um, and it I mean by far um, overwhelmingly over ninety five percent are either don't either to renovate to replace or not, they don't specify which of those options, but say to not close um, for various reasons. Um, I, I, but just to, that have all been said tonight, well, some about property value, some about transportation time, class size, um, and all of that is really valuable and relevant to this discussion tonight. Another thing I've been thinking about is that um, my work on the North Mont Code Technical Career Center, um, I work with the superintendent and board members from Souderton Area School District, and there is the only brick and mortar charter school that is in Montgomery County is in that school district. And approximately 185 students from Souderton attend that brick and mortar charter school, which equals two and a half million dollars of the Souderton Area School District's budget. So that, to me, it would, to, to leave that open, to leave that space, to leave that vacancy in that neighborhood could potentially open the door for something like that in our district, which, of, of course, we don't want to see that um, because of the educational excellence that our public school system is currently providing. So those are my thoughts on this. Thank you. Are there any other further questions? If not, thank you for your comments. Um, uh, I will, I will uh, add the uh, resolution uh, for the board's consideration uh, for January. Uh, next on the agenda, I have Audubon Elementary School property discussion. So you, each board member should have at their table a, a, a one-page sheet. <coughs> And at the, at the high level of, of this uh, discussion, I'm just going to review the sheet so you know, you know, the board knows exactly what we're talking about. Um, but we have we have options. Uh, these options include again, folks. This is our this is our uh, first discussion about this really since uh, the building's been uh, mothballed uh, prior to the start of the uh, 2000. Uh, I believe it was 2016-17 school year. Right? So. Uh, Please know that 
I'm not at the, at the end of this discussion, except this evening, as, it, it, as of right now, I'm not going to make any recommendation or suggest that we take any action on this this month. Um, but but it, it is a starting point for us to start thinking about any questions and other information that we might have. So at, at, as, as, as this goes, mothballing uh, for delayed future determination. So we can continue mothballing it. And I just want to share some figures with you. So the annual cost uh, is about $65,000. If we add in insurance for, for the Audubon Elementary School, uh, that's, a, that's another $40,000, or it's $105,000 per year that will, it, it is budgeted right now for the 1920 school year uh, to maintain that building in its current state. Uh, there, just so you know, there may be a, other additional uh, maintenance costs that are not anticipated. So. We do regular inspections of the property inside and outside. Um, if something happens where maybe uh, you know a pipe burst or something is is uh, you know detrimental, you know something that happens that's detrimental to the long-term uh, viability of the property, we address it. And so you, you should just be aware of that. Uh, you know this provides you know having the building does provide some future opportunities or considerations in the future. So for example, uh, while the building may not necessarily in and of itself provide the, uh, uh, the opportunity to reopen it as a, as a school. Uh, the property itself uh, may be valuable for the district in, in the future in some, in some capacity. Um, and, you know, which currently you know, we may be able to offload during the uh, mothballing, may be able to offload the, uh, the district or other educational services uh, to this location. So we kind of do that to some extent now. Option B would be to sell Audubon Elementary School. Um, there will be likely a financial return to offset any potential future need uh, for, for land use. Uh, it provides a one-time infusion of cash, uh, depending on obviously what we sell it for. Um, just so the board's aware that once we sell the property because it is a capital item, that money must be put into the capital reserve by law. So it's not like we can take that and use that money to offset the budget. So know that you know you could take it and and, and do other renovations, other capital renovations in, in other buildings, but you can't use it to offset expenditures to the budget. Uh, if we do sell the property, it limits our future options to address potential growth in, in the future. Uh, we have no, and one of these things it, we have no control over the buyer impact on the community. So uh, what that means is you should know that. Uh, and I'll, I'll be talking a little bit later about how it's, the property is zoned and what it can be used for in the future. Uh, that's something that we'll need to consider. Um, if we decide to sell the property, we're going to re be required to handle the, the uh, placing of the property on the market. So it might require some legal costs, uh, some uh, realty services, uh, etc. Uh, the third option would be to donate or sell uh, for a public use. Uh, so um, under, the, under the law, uh, the district can uh, donate it uh, for public use uh, to, say, for example, uh, it would, to Lower Providence Township, as, as an example. Um, this can afford, you know, us an uh, opportunity for a public benefit of some sort. It could provide uh, some valuable partnering opportunities uh, in the areas for families. Uh, uh, but, but again, one of the questions is, do we have obligations to all the taxpayers to maximize the use of this land? That's, that's kind of a, a question for the board. Uh, on the, in terms of announcements, just some context of, 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 this, of this decision. Um, an appraisal was conducted of the property and, with, and that information was shared with the board. Uh, this information is not public um, and, and it, the fact that the, uh, uh, the boards shall, should decide that they uh, want to sell the property uh, that uh, assessment will be kept in confidence until such time that the property is sold uh, so that it doesn't uh, attract or detract from the potential sale uh, price of the property. Another announcement zoning, it, it should be known that the, uh, the property is zoned residential with an overlay for school and municipal use. So generally speaking, uh, you're, you know, the way it's zoned today, the, if we sell the property, there won't be a wall law on the corner. Uh, they're, 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 well, people may want that, but unless the township decides to change the zone, it, it wouldn't happen. So another school could operate uh, on that property. Uh, as uh, Ms. Drummond had mentioned, another school could be a, a charter school, for example. Uh, that's not necessarily what we want. 
but uh, you know the uh, the town or the township could use it for uh, community benefit. And lastly, uh, it should be known that the township has shared uh, that they have some interest in all the part of the property. So some considerations uh, for the board as we start these conversations. Uh, the cost of mop hauling, obviously the, the cost uh, and, and the ongoing cost, you know, it would be $105,000 on an annual basis going forward, depending on when we sell the property or if we decide to you know, put it to use uh, to have a return on investment of that 105. Another consideration uh, is, is any associated cost as determined by the most recent facilities assessment. So, so generally speaking, if you were to hold it in, in mothball at for potential use, uh, we, we probably shouldn't consider the facilities assessment of about $11 million uh, for the renovation of, of Audubon to be the cost associated with bringing Audubon back online for use as a school. Uh, depending on the number of years that uh, it sits in mothballing, uh, there may be some additional cost. Uh, it, it, and, and there were some considerations to the actual uh, condition of that property, even though there were $11 million of projected renovations, uh, that that may not have been complete in terms of putting it in proper alignment with our other schools in the district. Uh, another uh, consideration is long-term needs of the district giving our enrollment projections. We talked about that this evening. This potential that maybe that property is, is something that you know would have a new school on it or where we would renovate a school. Uh, and there may be some others that uh, we might hear uh, as we go through these discussion processes. So questions for the board to consider this evening. Uh, does the board need any additional uh, pieces of information in order to move forward with the decision uh, to vote, as I, as I outlined above, if you have this document in front of you? Uh, secondly, would the board want uh, to entertain inviting Lowell Providence Township to present their recommendations uh, to the board at a future public meeting? I don't know when that could occur, but um, if the board would like to hear what public use the uh, township would think uh, they could use for this property, um, it may be worth uh, at least hearing um, before making a determination. And lastly, uh, for questions for the board to consider, is there a recommendation to place the item on the agenda uh, in January or in any time in the future based on uh, what I share or what our, our uh, conversation might be this evening? So, Let's open the floor. Any questions, comments, uh, concerns? Ms. Reese, you want to start? Um, I'll take number one first. Um, I believe, and you can either wait to tell me this or tell me this now, that based on what options we choose for the future and where we decide to go, that if we did run out of space or we find issues with full day kindergarten or things like that, that Woodland, Worcester, and Eagleville all are made to build onto, if I'm correct. So you, that can be shared later because, you know, on a very surface level, I'm not quite ready to commit to this, but I think if we pass the resolution to commit to four elementaries or at least four of those buildings, that even that we could add on to the remaining. And so I I'm not quite there, but I feel like I'm. I feel like I can say we don't need that. We'll we'll never make that into a, a school. So I don't know what kind of facility information we need for that. But I feel like if we ever run out of space, I would feel comfortable adding on to the other buildings. Yeah, we've said in a number of other conversations over the history of this discussion process, not particularly about all of them, but about the other buildings and, and Arrowhead and school consolidation that uh, those other elementary schools could be added on to. Okay. Um, and that, as far as number two, um, I mean, if Lower Providence has, wants to come and present, I don't, I'm not opposed to that. I mean, they're our partner in, in this community, you know, that they would like to come present, um, you know, I don't see a huge, I don't know about a huge windfall, but you know, I'm not ready to say sell it, but that's where I'm leaning towards. But I would be open to listening to what the township has to say. Any other comments to my left? I just, I just was wondering what um, the item where it says may be able to offload other district or educational type services to this location. So I, I guess there's certain 
the re to open it as a school, certain things would have to be done, but not to do uh, have it used as other uses that are still educationally related. Yeah. So uh, I don't have a particular uh, suggestion for that, but uh, you know, as, as simple as, as it possibly, you know, we could re renovate the the, uh, the building and we could move, you know, the administrative team to that building. Let's say, for example, uh, that would be the least amount of cost in renovation because we wouldn't necessarily need all the same things as students might need if the renovation occurred. We certainly wouldn't need all the existing space that's there either. Oh, my quick thing is that, um, sorry, for even for the public and for my own, just being able to see that if we were reaching out to the Y to benefit our community, and if that was something they were interested in that property, besides, I definitely think Lower Providence Township, if they were interested, they're more than willing they should present, but knowing other nonprofits that would want that land or were interested or in the past. I, I, I'm not 100 percent certain, but I believe that there are some restrictions on the uh, on the on the actual donation of, of the property. Uh, it, it, not necessarily just a nonprofit, but I think it has to be another governmental agency. And and please know that uh, it would have to it, it would have to fall under the the, uh, the use of the property would have to fall under the zoning for that is zoned right now. So it's either going to be residential, or being new homes. Or it'll be operated as a school, uh, or or for uh, uh, or for township use. So I think those are some clear indications that you know, a, while a Y might be a great thing because we have a lot of relationships in, in, for different aspects with the Y, uh, that may not necessarily be something that could house there. However, if the township were to take it, uh, they could you know offer. You know, they own the property. They could offer uh, the Y space into that uh, building that's on that property in the future. If that should occur, but the Y wouldn't necessarily be the owner be able to use it unless it was sold. Okay, uh, I just want to be clear on that. Yeah. So, as far as whether or not we need additional pieces of information, I, I would say that's a resounding yes from me. Um, I feel like we do have some information here, um, but certainly I feel like there's a potential to, to get some more information in. Uh, uh, there's a lot to consider. Um, one of my biggest concerns, if we were to go down the road of selling this property, is the fact that we do not have control over who buys it. Um, and so while it's wonderful to sit here and say that we would want to sell it to to another government entity that you know it could be used for community use and that would be wonderful the reality is it's also just as likely that it could be sold to a developer and used for residential use because that's how it's currently zoned um, which creates another whole set of concerns that we have to um, consider so at this point i think that the option i'd like to get more information on as a, as a priority would be the donating or selling for public use um, I'm not thrilled about donating. I, it, it seems like the property has, a, obviously it doesn't have quite the value that other parcels of land might have, but it certainly has value. Um, and I, I'd love to hear from Lower Providence Township, I'd love to have them come here and present to us um, and see if there's any way that we can explore a partnership with them to, um, to create something. It, I'm not even sure what that could look like at this point. We're still so preliminarily with this, but um, something that could benefit the community um, for for all of our residents, not just our students. Comments, Mr. Tiber. <clears throat> yeah, a couple things. Um, one, I think we should look at your other property, whether we sell it or whether we come to some kind of partnership with the township. Uh, the information that you just showed tonight show that we have the capacity in all the other buildings, at least going out 10 years, um, even in an increase. And we know that you know the K, most of that growth is K to four in those M and M scenario the, in the enrollment projections. So even if we look out past 10 years, some of that additional growth kind of takes up some of the space that's in Arcola, maybe the high school. Um, I think that uh, your suggestion about administrative offices, I think there's probably enough room in the high school if we wanted to close down Arena. And, about that, there might be a room right across the street here somewhere. Um, the, uh, 
Personally, I, I can touch on this, I'm not interested in the donation scenario. We don't have the financial luxury of donating a large chunk of property to somebody. Um, as we just talked about, we have <laughs> 14, 20, 25 million dollars hanging over our heads to, to continue to provide the education that our community expects. Um, so personally, I'm not interested in the donation scenario, but if the township wants to come and talk to us about how we can do it, or we're going to go to their meeting and do it, I, I think it's a great idea, right? Let's, let's find something that we can all do together as a community to make things better. Um, but we've got to get paid for the property, number one. Um, and maybe this is a question for you, maybe this is something that we can take back to the solicitor or, or somebody that's more specific about real estate. Um, and then we have an appraisal. Um, is there anything that prevents us from putting the property on the market and seeing who bites? Are, are we under any obligation at that point if somebody expresses an interest or wants to buy it to actually sell it? Could we just simply say, okay, thanks, we're not interested, the number's not what we thought? I, I'm not your solicitor, but I, 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 I can get that information specifically. But uh, I think that uh, that is that is, we have that right to do that. I, I don't think any any rights have been taken away from us in terms of you, know, you do that in a, in a home uh, sale game as well. It, it was really it's really up to the, the, the seller, regardless of the, of the price that you get, whether or not you want to sell. Uh, we have we have some restrictions in terms of. Uh, how to advertise, and certainly uh, we have to get the, the, the best price uh, for, for the property. And the best price may not necessarily be in line with the uh, uh, the assessed or the... Uh, right, and that's my, that's my yeah, concern. That's, yeah. that's, 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 that's the challenge that we face. Um, regarding regarding mothballing, do we have a number for what it would take, maybe this isn't going to be a popular thing to say, but what it would take uh, to, to demo the property? Um, I don't have a specific number for you, um, but I think when we originally, uh, re you know, received the um, uh, the appraisal back, um, I had conversations with the solicitor at that time that it's likely uh, because of being a public entity and, and the type of Contracts that we have to enter into, we, we generally see about a, a, a 35 percent increase in our cost to demo the property than what a, uh, a private uh, company <coughs> or the land would have. Uh, we it, it, and, and I don't think it's. I'm not going to tell you what that number was, but I think generally speaking, it, it's it's not a good number uh, for us to to demo the property. How does it, I mean, from an order of magnitude, are we talking about, I mean, you're talking about another $100,000 a year to maintain the property in a mothball state, um, including insurance costs. So obviously our insurance costs would be considerably lower if there were no buildings there. Um, that's a number I'd be interested in knowing. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, because I think as much as attractive as the main building is, and I would love to do something that, you know, again, if we're going to do something with the township that kept that main structure there, um, as attractive as it is and as old as that building is, that would be great. Um, but from a purely financial decision, maintaining it at $100,000 a year for it to sit there, um, to me, doesn't make sense if it's going to cost us $200,000 to demo it. Um, Obviously, yeah, it'd be less expensive for yeah. somebody else to do it, right? But, but, but I, yeah, so that's, that's part of the, the, the big determination. We're going to hold on to this property. Um, and we know that it's, it's going to be held you know, for a number of years. Um, you're absolutely on the right path. I mean, you, you, don't want to, you don't want to incur these costs. And obviously, that becomes an eyesore for, for the community, and it, it becomes a challenge. Uh, so we, don't, we certainly don't want that. But uh, we'll explore that number, and we'll get that report. And not to, oh, sorry, not to piggyback off that, but if you did demo it, would that land not be able to be used as just practice property, like practice, and grass that we can use for practice, athletics, where we can utilize it? It's just an option. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a number of options now that becomes uh, just a field. I mean, you know, generally speaking, um, that's part of our educational program. We can, uh, you, know, you know, expand that if that's what we wanted to do. Other comments, Mr. Winters? 
Yeah, I, real quick, I was going to ask the same question, so I'm probably unpopular too. Um, I, I tend to agree that mock blind doesn't seem to be a, a logical aspect. Uh, the way I look at it is that most likely the expansion in the school district would be happening in other, other parts of the school district, most likely not concentrated around mock blind. But uh, I mean, we do have school down that way in Woodland, but that's just a aside there but the, the the cost of the one element that I do need to, to think about that honestly uh, haven't been uh, at the top of my mind is the obligation to the Worcester taxpayers so that it is a lower Providence uh, issue if they would be interested in it and Worcester does pay and the, the citizens of Worcester are paying the same uh, bill as lower Providence residents so uh, the the issue of donate and sell uh, by itself in itself uh, does raise up some questions I don't know what that means how I would think I think it all the way through but I think it's one point that you brought up that I need to be clear on any other comments Mr. Uh, yeah just a couple of things you can add me to the list on the, the demo number that's on up in here um, I have to say that, again, mock mauling to me for any extended period of time just seems like a waste of money. Um, in terms of selling that property, um, also against this option, um, being that it's zoned residential, um, I think the last thing we need to do in that area of lower Providence is to sell it to, for residential purposes, to put homes or town homes in an area where we just closed the school, where the sending area would be to Woodland, which is the highest elementary school. So I think that it's basically just shooting ourselves in the foot. Um, I would be interested to see what um, Lower Providence Township has in mind, um, what kind of partnership, well, I'll use that word specifically, um, that they might have in mind. Um, I don't think it's a good idea for us to, to donate the property to them. Uh, Paul brought up the one point that we also have to consider Worcester. Uh, the second point is that if we donate the property to them and you know, sign over the land, uh, we had no control from that point forward with what they do with the land after that. So they may come to us with an idea for the next couple of years, and maybe that pans out, maybe it doesn't, and then they go and they sell to a residential developer anyway, which lands us in the same scenario that I just mentioned. Um, so I'd be, I'd be curious to see if there's a, some type of partnership either with them or with you know, some other local companies. We've got a great new communications director here. Can we reach out to do something for, again, I think you mentioned it here, you know, for public use? What kind of partnership can we do that the entire public, lower Falcons, four sister, whoever, that you know, it doesn't hamper us as a school district in terms of adding more kids to the district and stuff like that, um, but it can provide a partnership, something that benefits the community. I would like to do something along, along those lines. So, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments on Audubon? Because if, if there's not, I, here's what I have right now. Uh, we wanted to get information on uh, what it would be to how, how much it would cost to demo the property. Um, it looks like we want to also invite uh, Lower Providence Township to a meeting in the future uh, for them to present to us uh, what some of those partnership options could be. And, I, and I'll also, and, and just taking the, the cue from you, Mr. Ryan, is, is that uh, administratively we'll talk about what things we think we can partner with the township on. So uh, taking it from our, our perspective and and assuming like maybe that we are these, we maintain the ownership of the land and we work with the township to do certain things that are to no benefit to the community as so long as uh, they align within the law to uh, you know, continue us with uh, you know, uh, using the facilities at, at, under the educational use terms. Um, okay, uh, any other, I'm sorry. The, the next time we talk about this, could you provide us with a schematic of the property with the, uh, uh, like, so we can see how big exactly it is and where the building lies, just so we can get a visual sense of what we're talking about. Absolutely. That's not a problem. Yes, Mr. Yeah, just, just to add, I'm, I'm in the camp of everybody said we need to find some way to monetize this asset, whether that's a sale, some sort of partnership that brings revenue to the district. Um, I think this is an asset that's, you know, if we're heading down the road, if our head remains, I don't see this opening here opening as a school anytime in the near or distant future. Um, so if Lower Providence is going to come just asking for a donation or some kind of 
zero cost lease or something like that, that's a non-starter for me. Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda is the budget surplus discussion and recommendations. So there is another uh, sheet here uh, in front of you. Um, so so um, just on the last discussion, so there will, there will be no item on the agenda regarding uh, Audubon for uh, this month. Um, I will reach out to uh, Lower Providence Township to see what we can schedule given our uh, board and, and work session schedule. Okay? And I'll, and I'll report back. Uh, with regard to the budgetary surplus, and, and we'll, we'll uh, include Mr. Berger on in on this conversation, but it should be known that at the end of the 2018 or 17-18 uh, school year, uh, due to a number of factors, and, and maybe Mr. Berger, you can uh, uh, bring those to the high level uh, factors up, that uh, the, the district uh, uh, experienced a surplus of about uh, $2.6 million. Of that $2.6 million, they passed a resolution uh, in, I believe, April or May of, of, of that year that said anything, uh, any, any money beyond the 7% uh, uh, of the fund balance in a surplus would be allocated to the capital projects account. The capital projects are those things that are, that are, uh, are being addressed uh, from the facilities assessment. So uh, we've had uh, a number of a number of presentations on, on that to this point. Uh, Mr. Berger, just, just quickly highlight some of the uh, matters that resulted in, in the uh, uh, surplus. Uh, sure. So one of the first areas that changed was, as I mentioned in the presentation earlier today, with regards to income. Uh, when we started the budget for the 17-18 school year, the interest rates were uh, 0.1%. Um, and going through the school year, hitting up all the banks and telling them, hey, rates are going up, we need more rate and returns. We finished the school year at, I think it was 0.9% on our bank accounts and 1.25% on our CD. So, you know, significantly higher, to, to say the least. So that drew some of the uh, additional revenue we had uh, in, the, in the surplus. Um, so interest income was about $360,000, real estate taxes due to the uh, increases in assessment accounted for $270,000, uh, earned income tax was another you know, $264,000. Ultimately, um, all that just translated into additional revenue which contributed to the surplus of, I think it was roughly $600,000 off the top of my head. Um, with regards to the expenses, due to the strike and not paying the teachers for the three days, uh, there was a savings to the salary. That then impacts the savings to the teasers, which impacts the savings on the Social Security. But that also has an offset negative impact to the revenue side also. Um, additionally, the operational budgets were actually over budget by about six hundred. $30,000. So at the end of the day, we put everything together. Um, the salaries and benefits and expenses were significantly lower than we anticipated, which is directly related to the salaries and the benefits. Thank you, Mr. Berger. So this evening, um, it was brought up uh, before you is, is a recommendation uh, based on uh, the conversations we had, I believe, in November or December uh, of, of last uh, calendar year about the uh, the surplus. As of right now, the surplus is sitting, uh, about two million is sitting in the uh, master plan uh, facilities uh, uh, budget. Uh, before you is a recommendation to keep 893,000 in the master plan, move 893,000 uh, to the capital reserve, and one-time budget expenses of about 226,000 uh, to be used to uh, potentially lower the uh, the tax rate uh, currently in the proposed preliminary budget from 2.29 is that what it is right now 2.29 2.3 oh, yeah, no, the at one that point is 2.3 we're at 2.2928 okay 2.29 to under uh, two under two percent uh, that would give you a total uh, that's available in this in, from the surplus. 
uh, that was generated to the master plan of $2,014,000. Uh, uh, so uh, again, this was uh, recommended. Uh, we, we, we had a conversation with the finance committee. It kind of uh, has been adjusted from the finance committee meeting. So uh, I don't know if Mr. Armstrong, you have any comments on this um, or anyone else from the finance committee or any other members of the board. But what I'd like to do is uh, at least uh, get your input and potentially uh, put a, re a resolution on the agenda to uh, either consider our recommendations or uh, some other uh, aspect uh, laid out here. Laid out here. Sure. Um, well, first, thank you for, for continuing to revise this and moving towards the direction I was hoping to head, but you're not fully there yet. Um, I would suggest, given where we're at in the budget process, the pending decision next week on Arrowhead, and the completion of the staffing analysis you're working on, that's going to be done by the end of February, that this be shelved for at least a month, if not more. I don't disagree with what your recommendation is. I'm just following up on the recommendation to bring the surplus discussion to the January meeting, which was our last discussion. So I'm just doing what I'm told. Uh, no, but I, I do agree with exactly what you I, said. I, I agree with that, but then I think I thought we talked at the finance committee meeting towards the end of the meeting that we've got big items that need to get. You know, we get the budget process further down the road because I'm sure there will be changes. You've got staffing potential adjustments. Tim's going to adjust the interest income again upwards. Um, <laughs> and I'm sure we've got to change. So you're, you're, you're out of line. You're out of line. <laughs> <laughs> And, and the, the scaling analysis, I think, is a, is a big thing in, in next year's budget that's got to get resolved. And we've got to see where that looks like before we, you know, make decisions on this. And I think we also have to balance the timing along with the bargaining discussion we need to have about the master plan projects for the this summer. summer yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I agree. Um, if, if there are no other comments from uh, members of the board, I, mean, I, I think that's a great recommendation. But uh, I. I I think moving forward, that makes sense. I, I just have a question. Oh, so if we're at, in this proposed preliminary budget, 2.2928, is that correct? Um, between the proposed preliminary budget that we see in January and the final adopted budget, what is typically the amount of wiggle room, or how much differential is, is typically Maybe it's not typical in any one year. I don't know. Um, from year to year, from the pre preliminary to the final. Well, here, here, here's what we're working on. We're working on uh, creating uh, a list of what the the uh, the uh, regular variable items are. So two of them is health care and uh, our prescription plan. So in the budget presentation, we have a first look. Generally speaking. Uh, on a yearly basis, uh, by the time we get a third look, which is our final look, um, we, we've had some de we've had decreases. But we, there's no guarantee that it will be a decrease. But we're putting a, we're putting that list together like those items so that the board can follow along with us and look at those major we'll call them ticker points where it could go up or down based on decisions or based on the market or based on information that we get back at, at a later date in this process. But it's a good question. And, uh, and, and so we hope, generally speaking, that from where we start in January to where we end in June, there's a reduction. That, that's what we've always worked towards. But I don't know how much that will be. Any, any other comments to uh, Mr. Wright? Okay. Mr. Yeah, right. um, I hope that we don't go down as much, that there is as much adjustment this year as there was in previous years, mostly because of the work that you guys have done so far try to clean up a lot of this stuff. I know there's a couple of areas that we all have interest in that we think there's, there's some, some room that we could uh, cut expenses down even further. But um, the one thing I did want to add was, one of the things that came up last night in property committee discussion has been the second phase of the MEP work at the high school. Um, we postponed it from having been done this summer in 2018 uh, because we pulled forward so much work at our coal to, to complete that project all at once and only close the auditorium down one time. Um, it, we talked about a project where, in Fairbridge information, one of the big one of the big things we've been focusing on the property is is envelope issues. We're talking about roofs, we're talking about walls, we're talking about windows, 
but also the humidity control within the buildings, right? I think we would all acknowledge that, especially this past year, that, that was a tremendous issue. It continues to be an issue. We had mold issues in, in, uh, in a couple of buildings this year that, that we cleaned up, but you know, we also know that there were several schools in our area that had much bigger issues uh, and had to the point of closing buildings for extended periods of time. So we're very cognizant of that, and we want to make sure that we address that. One of the projects that's on the table is to replace the unit ventilators in one entire wing of the high school. And not just replacing them, but also adding humidity control to them so that there would be an effective you know, uh, uh, humidity control as, as load changes within the building. Um, I don't know if it's worthwhile for Dan to talk about it while he's here, and just give us a, a kind of a, a brief overview. We might go too far into the details. But the fact of the matter was, there's an opportunity, the project as a whole, is $2 million, okay? Um, if we split the project in half and do one floor at a time, um, we can cut the cost in roughly half. So if we, I think the way the committee was moving forward, we wanted to move forward with at least half of it, but there's other options as to how we can pay for it, the other half and get it done, right? We're all very sensitive to this idea of kicking the can down the road and, and where that's gotten us so far. If there's an opportunity to use a million dollars of this surplus to pay directly for that and get that work done this summer or perhaps on some extended schedule, um, we should look at that. So it's, it's an extra added wrinkle into this discussion um, rather than just saying it's, it's for the master plan and even though the master plan has details in it, this is one specific project that would allow us to kind of pull that forward and uh, get it done now. Um, Real quick, because I, that was my question, this unit ventilators came up last night, and so we discussed, I believe, it being added to finance. So I'm comfortable, you know, tabling this. I'm glad we talked about it, but it was brought up that it should be discussed at finance next month. So this was the perfect time to tell all of you that since property just happened last night. So we didn't get a chance to tell you that these unit ventilators. Yeah, the following was that next, next month, property falls before finance again, so we'll have more information before we roll into the finance meeting and into our board next month. So, yeah, just to end my little soliloquy here, I, I agree with Brian, I think we've closed the table this for right now. Any other comments uh, uh, that is di that are different from Mr. Navarrets or uh, uh, Mr. Earnshaw's in regard to just putting this away and uh, knowing that we have these resources in our bank pocket to address a number of potential issues Including, you know, the the you know the decision on on Arrowhead as well as a decision on high school and other and other projects. Okay, great. And we move on. Moving on to the agenda in January, I, I already spoke about the additional presentations. That ends the presentations here for this evening. We'll go over the reports. Um, notice there's a number of advisements. There are four trips that were listed here. Uh, some for um, uh, the wrestling team some for the orchestra, and one for the uh, varsity cheerleaders uh, to competitions that fell outside the normal window where the board would approve. Again, these were overnight trips that the board would normally approve based on policy and uh, notification as I'm doing here. Um, we were able to allow those students to participate. There will be uh, public comment on board action items uh, next week, and then uh, and the board minutes, and we go to fiscal items. So we, on, on the agenda for this evening, we have a list of bills, treasury report, budgetary transfers, mileage reimbursement, Act 1 resolution, and we have the master plan projects. I'm going to ask if, if it's okay with the board that we skip right to the master plan projects. I have two of our consultants here this evening. Um, if they would just come forward, and we can address those. If this is new information for most of the board, these items, there, were, there are there are five, they were added today. Um, those items were a result of uh, recommendations to move these items forward from the property committee that was held last evening. So Dan, uh, Mark, or whoever's representing, we just want to make sure that uh, you know, we see there's five, there's five areas of, and are there any other questions on those, on those areas uh, information. So Mark, just generally tell us what these are. <coughs> Uh, yes, tonight I want to first talk about the uh, master plan project with uh, regards to the transportation study. We have the transportation study that was done by McMahon. Press the button. Thank you.
We had a transportation study uh, done by a man who was part one at the high school, and um, that was completed. We came back now to as for the uh, part two, which has to do with the counts and traffic flows and uh, the usage of the parking, the bus drop-offs, all that um, articulation around the, around the campus to be able to um, ascertain some more information, be able to look at our uh, safety, etc. Um, and that, that study was for $8,000, and they would have it completed. We anticipate doing that early in the springtime. So very similarly, um, Heinrich and Klein Associates of AM were, um, were also requesting to do a similar study at uh, Arcola for uh, $6,900, and included with that would also be uh, looking at the, the existing uh, traffic and looking at potential access for the feasibility of the, uh, access um, into the property or off of the property. Okay. Personally, yet, but that's what I understand from the report. 
Uh, and that's, that's a no-no. You can't have that step, and that has to be corrected. We say pads, pads, <coughs> maybe a solution to raise it, maybe a, a, a very shallow ramp, but we have to come up with some uh, correction there. And that's at all the doors? So. Uh, wherever it applies. Wherever it's a problem. Thank you. Other questions? Mr. Ryan? Just real quick, um, there's so many projects going on in different areas. Were all five of these projects um, anticipated and within the estimated cost that we thought that they would be? It's my understanding that we call these, these are the soft costs as they apply to the actual projects when they're designed, specified, and bid. We call these the soft costs. And it's my understanding that all these prices fall within the budgeted amounts that have been on, on your paper. Okay. That's my understanding, if that, if that addresses your question. Yes, it does. Thank you. And in terms of, so you mentioned the bidding process of these for the ones that are, especially the higher value one, the 28600 this was properly bid in the smaller amounts I'm assuming were called around for. Well, it's also my understanding that this, this project was actually a follow-up to a previous project that I personally wasn't involved in, but it's my understanding that this follow-up on the canopies has to have a lot to do with a lot of uh, the issues that this firm was previously dealing with. So it's my understanding that this was not bid out, but it was a follow-up to a previous project. Sure, go ahead. No, no. Good evening. <laughs> no, just because that was back. <laughs> um, pointing the answer to your question is the, uh, the three items that Bob brought up are all items that he previously approved as far as budgeted work for the 2019 master plan year. So these are just the design contracts, and all of them were competitively, either competitively bid or we got several proposals, and some, I mean, we don't always advertise for them, but it's professional. Services so there's a there's a very it depends on the particular application. Um, we must have like ten design contracts and the 2019 scope of work. But again, all of it is is work you've already previously approved. But if you just to recall, when you approved the whole master plan process a year plus ago, you wanted to see not just the bids that came in afterwards, but you wanted to see the design work in in, in relation to that scope of work when we got to that point. So you've already, and I know you just wanted, to, most of the design work you've already approved in the stock reserve you alluded earlier, it's just about to all go out the bid. So this is just like the last reference of it. Okay, yeah, I just want to double check in terms of the, the dollar amounts there, because when we approve them as a whole, you know, it's, it's lumped in as a whole of, you know, soft costs or whatever, so we don't see necessarily the budgeted amount for each portion. So I just want to make sure that they're in line with what we expected for each individual. But then when we actually do the work, we track it soft and hard separately. Thank you very much. Any other questions? If not, uh, we'll go back up to, thank you, uh, we'll go back up to uh, the, the, the first items on your fiscal, which will be our, our common items. Uh, Mr. Bricker, Mr. Bill is treasurer of the report budget or transfers. Anything for Mr. Bricker and, and those items? Seeing none, uh, mileage reimbursement. Uh, this is an annual uh, item that we, that, we, that we put on if there is an adjustment to the Internal Revenue Service. There is one. We, uh, we're asking for the, the board's approval on that next week. The actual resolution. Uh, Mr. Berger. So, as seen in the budget presentation, we're not going to be exceeding the 2.3, and there are no exceptions. As such, it's being recommended that we approve Resolution 19-01, which is the taxpayer relief back affirming that the school district will limit the 2019-2020 fiscal year tax increase not to exceed the actual index of 2.3%. Any other questions? Are there any objections to putting that on the agenda for next week? Seeing none, that ends the fiscal items. Any other questions for Mr. Bill? If not, on the personal items, uh, we see a number of personal items there. Are there any particular personal matters uh, that are uh, for Mr. Regina at this time? Yes. Just a, a couple of questions. Um, items C and D, are these new or replaced positions? Uh, item C is a new position. Uh, it's one of the the items I know that we had discussed previously based on caseloads um, and, and meeting those, I 
expectations. Item D was an employee that has resigned, and we we're fortunate enough to fill that position rather quickly in an area that we didn't quite expect to fill quickly. So we're very happy about that fill as well. So D is a replacement. D is a replacement. Sorry. That's correct. So, we'll, we'll, so what we'll do is we'll make sure that uh, you know, between the uh, work session and the, the voting meeting, we'll have the data associated with the uh, the uh, part time. Uh, or, I'm sorry, the 0.5 uh, additional position. Uh, this is a special education position, correct? Well, so there's that's a, correct. So, so there's a uh, uh, there's a, uh, a requirement for us to expand. So we'll get that data. And we'll provide that to the board. Okay. Then the my last question was on L4. He doesn't explain what the K of four report card committee is. Sorry, it's in my minutes. It, it's an education committee item. Uh, I know it's something that they're investigating the elementary report cards moving into the future. And a lot of that is teacher input and getting um, some of those extra duty contracts for teacher input. Did I explain that? Okay. So, so currently, uh, the, the electronic system is not used as a grading system for the uh, elementary K 4. Elementary uh, teachers. Uh, also, those the report cards aren't aren't necessarily uh, specifically aligned to the standards and things that we uh, are, are using and how we are grading. So that work is being done with Dr. Katona and, and members of her staff in order to align that and to provide a more efficient means of not just sharing grading information with parents, but we believe that the report card. And the, and the ongoing use of the report card is on our more effective communication tools uh, for parents about the progress of, of their children. So uh, this way it will align all of our, our uh, uh, grades K through 12 with the uh, regular input and use of the grading system for communication purposes. Any other questions? And, and this is something that requires a supplemental contract uh, we need the support of and, and uh, input from teachers. Uh, this is something that we need to get done, uh, and it is my recommendation that uh, we leverage the expertise of our, of our staff. Otherwise, we're, we're going we're gonna to continue to fumble through a process that, that requires their input in order for us to, to have an efficient means to communicate with their families. Our teachers are our best resource in, in making these decisions. Any other questions on personnel matters? To my left, to my right, seeing none, we'll move on to uh, the next item on the agenda, which is uh, curriculum and programs. Seeing there are no items, uh, Dr. Bertona will be presenting uh, our 2018 uh, progress uh, report. Uh, seeing under policy, there are two policies for personnel, political activities and contracted service personnel. There are no matters for your approval next Next, um, next week, uh, so there's nothing for second reading. <clears throat> under other, there are gifted donations. Uh, there is Underwater Construction Corporation uh, from uh, Connecticut for the high school car club, a gift of a thousand dollars. There are three trips: one for the high school band, one for the high school chorus, and one for the girls lacrosse program. We would appreciate your approval of those. And then it goes on to dates for board members' calendars. And I'll turn the, uh, uh, the microphone back over to our, our president. Thank you, Dr. Zerbe. Um, anything to come up during old business or new business here this evening, Mr. Navarrete? Yeah, just one quick question. So there's an issue brought up at property this night regarding the agenda for the meeting tonight, that there's a number of items that weren't added until later, um, or was it complete? Did we get any? I'm not, I'm not sure. <coughs> Okay. There, was an, there was an issue brought up last night that maybe the agenda was incomplete when it was posted or there were things added late. And I'm not sure whether that's accurate or not because I didn't look at the online agenda. Um, I looked at the copy they provided us. Um, my question though is about, did we come up, we had talked before about trying to find a way to timestamp when changes were made. Yeah, so so we're, we're, we don't have the ability to timestamp, but I explained that the only thing that was changed from its normal 72 hours were the five items that were added to the uh, agenda based on the property committee. Because uh, I, I think you might be referring to the items for Arrowhead and, and even Audubon. Yeah. I put them in myself. 
that was on Saturday morning. Okay. So, so we there is no way for us to timestamp. There's nothing we can add to the agenda anywhere. There's no there's no text field that we can add that's updated. Like we you know, like on the budget slides we say last update you know one nine is there's no way we can do that in any anywhere in there. The, the, in the software, there's not a, a way to do that. Anything else for new business or old business? Okay, seeing none, we'll open it up to courtesy of the floor. Mr. Andrews. Good evening. John Andrews, uh, Lower Providence. I appear here after 14 years of interest and input towards quality education. That's after a successful career as a rocket scientist preceded by quality education. Today we witnessed the tail end of a hurried scheme to satisfy the superintendent's goal of an arrowhead determination by March 31, as just voted upon in November. A good and substantial part of any community's future is its schools and how they affordably provide education, efficiency, and value to the stakeholders. It's worth deliberate study of any changes. I see serious arrowhead problems. A questionable m and &M projection with faulty reasoning, yet endorsed by the superintendent. It is an old school. After 14 million of fixes, in the end, it will still be a small, unsecure, and obsolete design. A sketchy claim that Skyview Arcola can't satisfy any reorg program if Arrowhead is closed. Current debt and a budget that allow for little added debt for many years to come. Other facilities need renovation across the district and admin to denying basic facts from the public and avoiding communication with the public. A likely recession that may defer new homes after 10 years of economic expansion while our enrollment continues its decline. We have a faulty, rushed, and inadequate decision process, in my opinion, including hidden inputs by the public, over 100 of them. No mail is to the taxpayers, public and business, aside from tax bills. 75% have no students in our schools. I had suggested a public committee to address the Arrowhead issues, but seemingly it has been worked by our superintendent alone. The possible political considerations of the 2019 director election cycle, and perhaps more problems. I submitted a recommendation for Arrowhead closure and a K-5 set of schools, including Skyview and 6 to 8 at Arcola, and I hold to it with an eventual build of a new arrowhead, if needed. Tonight we, we heard some uh, scoring on that idea, and I think the, uh, the scoring doesn't look too bad to me, especially considering that the un enrollment numbers that went into it are, are very questionable. However, you and the public need more time to thrash out the above problems and a workable solution not an emotional one. The late start to this effort forces you to delay a decision. That has cost and benefit. There's time for a public study. I wanted to say more, but why inflict the calm violence of a timekeeper on us all? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Andrews. This is Geis. Jenny Geis, Woodland Kindergarten. Um, with the upcoming dreaded four-letter word in the forecast, beginning with S, ending with W, and a big old no in the middle, <laughs> I wanted to make a request this week instead of next week that before you approve the Education Committee meetings, you perhaps edit slightly. One of my comments there was really talking about moving the report card um, dates that in the event of inclement weather, we please, 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 please consider also moving the date that report cards are due. Um, I know we already had one date that affects this marking period. And if Thursday night storm really does impact Friday, which technically is the, one of the last days in the marking period, if you could please consider when we have inclement weather, 
that changes the school marking period to also change the report card window, your teachers would be absolutely grateful. And if it could be edited in the minutes, that was one of my comments. Um, changing all the things on the website is also important, but we really would appreciate that when school was canceled, the marking window was also changed. So, thank you. Anthony Arnaud, Lower Providence Township. Uh, well, I can't stand here and attest to be an expert to the numbers as it relates to student projection. I can only defer to those that have completed the study with their 10 plus years experience. Um, what I can stand before you and state is that I have 18 years experience as a professional engineer uh, working in a building design industry as an electrical engineer. Uh, I'm an associate at my firm, a large architectural engineering firm. I've had experience in uh, a gamut of different uh, practices, healthcare, uh, sports and entertainment, and academic. And, and through my experience in, in those roles and responsibilities, um, I've seen the importance of not stressing or pushing towards a design that focuses on bare minimum. When we talk about space allotment, space utilization, and how it, uh, how it is mandated by code to hit a minimum or by, by certain entities to hit a minimum, that's not always the best course of action. Um, what we look at when, when we take into uh, uh, account what spaces are required, we look at uh, the ability for the individual or the occupant of a space to thrive in that environment. To, and in the education uh, sense, thriving is not just being able to attend the school, get a lesson plan, go home and do your homework. It's about having the space to afford you the ability to concentrate and focus on your work and develop your skills and, and hone your talents to become the next great individual in, in, this, in this world. What I got a chance to see firsthand as a volunteer as part of the Watchdog program, which is a great program at the school, is, is to be in the school and see the impacts of already of uh, the shutdown of Audubon and the impact of uh, the influx of students into Arrowhead in particular and how that affects things that you may not think about, the circulation through the space, the transition from room to room or room to, to gym or having to store uh, tables for the cafeteria to allow a gym class to take place and then shift quickly into allowing lunch to, to happen. Um, so it's, it takes a monumental effort from the staff there to make sure that the, the children's lives are not disturbed uh, and they can still focus on, on really the important part, which is, is learning. Um, so it's like I said, it's, it's really the push to thrive in that environment. And that's what I see um, kind of the support from the board and the discussions is really not pushing towards the bare minimum, but looking at, at what's best for our, our students and also taking into account you know, the, uh, the community at large and what's better for the community um, without, without this, you know, with, with taking into account everyone's opinion in this. What I can say is, is also as an engineer, uh, uh, we look at how that influx of students into other facilities not equipped to handle them could negatively impact the operational costs that are maybe not in the original budgets of some of these assessments in the facilities, uh, things that the HVA system HVAC system can be taxed more by adding increased population to the space. Architectural elements of the building are not equipped to handle maybe the, the increased uh, traffic through the, through the space. Uh, so we're, we're creating all these other potential uh, problems by starting to, to maximize capacity in, in the floor plan. Um, what I can say is uh, I would volunteer my own time if, if it's helpful as part of any of the considerations to lend my expertise to some of the some of the thoughts and questions that anyone may have, I'd uh, be willing to leave my contact for anybody that may want to pick my brain on some of these scenarios as we move forward in any direction. Um, hopefully, in, a, in the direction that we're looking at, the option uh, to keep our head uh, in play. Mr. Arnold, I'm sorry, I have to ask you to please wrap up. Sure. Yes. Yeah, so, so what I what I would say is that I can I can attest personally that the the most, uh, the biggest investment we can all make, the, the surest investment we can all make is in 
those educators and those, those students that are going to be our future. And I would never bet an eye at, at my money being spent towards the next generation, not just my children, but the next generation coming up, just as I didn't bet an eye uh, the money that comes out of my pocket to support things like Medicare and Social Security for the generations that came before me. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Mary Lou Clark, Lower Providence Township. As a retired resident of Lower Providence who has no children attending school in the Thefton School District, I moved here with the knowledge that the school district has an excellent reputation. That reputation allows my home to hold its value and will be a benefit to me should I ever decide to sell my home. I understand the struggle of increasing tax bills when on a fixed income, particularly when you're not directly utilizing the schools. But looking at the enrollment projections that have been presented and the new construction that has been approved, I feel it would be an enormous disservice to the students and taxpayers to close another school in this district. We need to maintain space for both current and incoming students to keep this area as a desirable one for people to want to live in. I have had the opportunity to spend some time in our, as a visitor at various events, and it's a wonderful school. The atmosphere that exists there is not one I have seen anywhere else. Building up this school and destroying that community would not be a benefit to the students. As a taxpayer, I support the schools. The children in this district deserve the best education possible. They are our future. As countless class size studies have shown, packing them into already crowded classrooms will not benefit them, and in turn our community as they grow older and become the decision makers. I urge you to hear the commentary from the public, not just the Arabic families, but community members like myself, and do what is in the best interest of the entire community by keeping our head open. Thank you. Hi, my name is Leah Arnon. I live in Lower Providence Township. I go to Arrowhead Elementary School. I am in the third grade. My teacher is amazing. So are the rest of the teachers at my school. I am part of the Arrowhead Student Council. Not only do I help the school, but I help the community too. Being a member of the Student Council has helped me to gain confidence, help others, and represent Arrowhead in the community. I also do many other school activities such as after school running club, recess running club, and play violin in the orchestra. In the fall, I ran a race that my after school running club coach told me about and came in second place. My sister came in third. Without the after school running club at Arrowhead, which is not offered at the other schools in the district, we would not have even known about the race. School couldn't be any better. I have lots of friends in and out of my class. If Arrowhead gets closed, my friends and I will get split up and all of the students will lose the sense of family that we have to keep together at Arrowhead. We had a lot more space when all of our closed two years ago, the classrooms became very crowded. We had a lot more space when I was in first grade compared to second, and it made it co more comfortable in the classrooms and less distracting to learn. I live in the neighborhood behind Arrowhead and have a pretty long bus ride to get to and from school already. Some of my friends live farther away and their bus rides are even longer. Closing Arrowhead and moving us to farther away schools will mean we will, mean we will be on the bus for even longer. Kids will have to wake up extra early to catch the bus they might not get enough rest, so when they get to school, they may be tired. It will be hard for them to pay attention and concentrate on what they're learning. After school, kids will have less time to complete their home homework or have free time to get their energy out. Arrowhead is very important to me, other students, and all the teachers. I love my school, and ho I hope that you will keep it open. Thank you.
very common. If you close air, has the other schools will get even more common. It will make it hard for my teacher to have a place to help me with my speech. My teachers are very nice. My teachers work very hard to teach everyone in the class and make everyone happy. Even though I live near air, have my last year is pretty long. If you close air, then my last year will be even longer. Please don't close air, and I love my school. Thank you. Kelly Arnone, Lower Providence. Um, just one thing I wasn't planning on mentioning, but I'm really concerned to hear about the fact that the time stamping is not happening. Um, it was something that I mentioned at the previous meeting. Several of you agreed that it was an important issue. I understand that you're saying that there's no option in the software. However, you're typing a document, and there is an option to type an extra line at the top that says, last edited this date and this time. And I really do hope that, that will be taken seriously as an issue. Um, it was a problem last meeting. It could very easily become a problem in the future. I'm not saying this one was adjusted, but just in general, I'm very concerned about that. Um, in preparing for the meeting tonight, knowing that Arrowhead's again sitting on the chopping block with the decisions to be made in the near future, it became a point of conversation at our dinner table, obviously. Um, it's hard to imagine that after having one school closed, split up, the other schools completely reorganized and reconfigured to accommodate those displaced students such a short time ago that here we are again. Last night, my third grader, Leah, asked to be excused from the dinner table quite early in the meal and repeatedly asked me over and over again. Finally, I said, where do you need to go? What is the problem? And she said, Mom, I want to go tell you something. I want to go write something. I have stuff to say. And my second grader quickly followed suit. Um, she said, Arrowhead is very important to her, and she would like to speak up to try to save it. Uh, my younger two also said they would like to speak, but this is a little bit past bedtime for them. We're already stretching. My point in telling you this is that both of my girls that you see here tonight have already gone through the closure and integration of one school into the other's once. They saw firsthand how it negatively affected their educational experience and that of their classmates. And they were willing to speak up on their own in an effort to prevent it from happening again. That alone is a testament to the education they're receiving at Arrowhead. I've mentioned before my concerns over the potential closure and a lack of space for all of the elementary students as they're reassigned. When Audubon closed, there was a noticeable increase in crowding at Arrowhead. My second grader, Sarah, who has an IEP for speech services, receives speech instruction in what is essentially a large closet. It's functional for now. Um, but closing another school is going to lead to further crowding. My third grader has a GRDP and is in the challenge program. The space they use is already shared with other classes. There's somebody in there all day as far as I'm aware of. Where will my daughters, along with the many others who receive legally mandated special education services, receive those services if we are taking approximately 400 more students from Arrowhead and packing them into three already full elementary schools? We can talk about switching classes all around, filling every single room for every spare minute of the day, but there will always be the students who need additional support and one-on-one -on -one instruction. Where will they go? How will they receive the services they need to be academically successful? Um, other ideas are presented to create more space, such as moving fourth grade or eighth grade into different school buildings. And while shuffling children around like that may look appealing at first glance from a fiscal perspective, are those changes developmentally appropriate for the students? Would those groupings be considered best practices in the educational community? We should be striving for the best. Um, Dr. Zerbe reported that there was only two homeroom spaces in the district opening in November. And according to the Malone Room Report, they said there's 500 homes coming in the next five years and we're going to see an enrollment spike. I would urge you to listen to the consultants that you hired that have years of experience. Everybody has something to say about this, but you hired people for a reason. Please hear what they are saying and take their expert opinion, because that's what we really should be looking at, experts in every area. As a board, you do represent the community, and we have heard from people on both sides, but our students and the quality of their educational expertise should be first and foremost in every discussion. Without a high achieving district, home values will suffer, and in turn, all taxpayers, as the community becomes less desirable and valued one to live in. From the presentations and reports that have been shared with the public, I believe it would be both an academically and fiscally irresponsible decision to close another school. Thank you very much. Lower Providence. Um, first, I just want to commend at the very beginning of all the presentations, Dr. Zerbe, you talked about our Keystone results and our PSSA's results. I've proctored those exams my entire career because I'm a teacher and I'm so impressed. I've served on um, with other teachers to help students who have struggled with passing them and with proficiency and my husband and I chose to move into Methacton when we moved in here five years ago because of the reputation of Methacton and because they're a good school district um, for many reasons. Um, and it was just really great to see those. So I just want to say thanks for sharing them. I know you have to, but still, thank you. That's awesome. 
Um, and I was relieved when, after presenting about Airhead, the majority of all of you board members shared that you would probably support Dr. Zerbe's proposal next week. Um, I'm an Airhead parent. My son goes to Airhead. He's a second grader with Mrs. Reed, and he's doing fabulously. Um, I also, though, yes, he's my child, and he's already gone through one um, redistricting, but also I have an eye on my property values all the time, and um, what you said really speaks to it. I'm very concerned about my property value if we close Arrowhead. That is something that's very, on, very much on the forefront of our mind because of how important um, school districts are. Um, and I also just wanted to come up um, and kind of speak to what Ms. Drummond said about charter schools. Um, my career has left me, has, I've ended up in cyber charter schools for over 10 years of my career as a teacher. And I was also in charter schools and in brick and mortar. And okay, we don't have a physical charter school here now, which speaks to how good our school district is. But cyber charter schools do exist. And many parents with kids in schools right now have an eye on school safety, as our school district has been um, working with, because there was a new program that just came out. I forget what it was called, but it was something. My son was trained in it, so I trust. But um, with every event that occurs, and with other things that are happening, cyber school, cyber charter school enrollment is going up. I've been in there for almost 10 years. I've been in three different ones, and all three have a very significant increase in student size. It hasn't happened for us yet. I was impressed that we only have 60 kids. I think it was 60, it might even be less, maybe 30. I don't remember, it was quick. But I was impressed that we only have that many in cyber charter schools right now, but it's an option. And parents who are concerned about increasing classroom sizes with the closing of their head, it's something that's there even if the physical school, brick and mortar charter school, isn't nearby. Here's one of the sons charter. We're like bottom of the list, you have to be in Kingsville to be accept that to be um, given priority first. But the cyber charter schools exist, and we need to keep that in mind. So I just wanted to speak to that, Ms. Drummond, and what you said, and say, yeah, that is something you need to consider. So thank you so much for all you do. Uh, thanks. Good evening. Alison Procopio, Lower Providence. I am a proud parent of one Arrowhead uh, daughter and two future Arrowhead students as well. Um, I'm going to keep my comments very short. I re reiterate all of the things that have been talked about, especially around the property value. My husband and I moved here two years ago and looked uh, very closely at the theft in Springford, Phoenixville, um, PV, so many good school districts bordering Methacton, and we chose Methacton because of the school district. Um, when we moved here, that's when redistricting happened. It did take us by surprise. Our daughter uh, didn't go to Ottawa, but would have, so was then transferred to, or moved, I guess, to Arrowhead, um, but we made out great in the end. We love Arrowhead so much, um, but we do realize that that would cause a lot of issues if we were gonna close another school. The geographic issues are just unimaginable. One thing that I did want to mention, um, I have been to the past few board member board meetings, and one thing that um, keeps coming up that I, that I have to say I really appreciate is this constant um, reminder of the educational benefits for our students. So looking at this from an educational standpoint, um, I am a former teacher and I now work in education policy. I work with state boards of education across the country, and I hear this all the time educational benefits, the educational benefits, but I feel it from you all. And I hear in what you say that you mean it. And I just want to say that I really appreciate that. And I think it comes through with all of the comments that you all make um, and your openness to listening and especially all the evidence that was provided today. One other piece of evidence that was um, kind of glossed over a little bit today that I just really want to highlight is um, the mention around some of the challenges with our teachers. So as we close schools, teachers are forced into new schools, and teachers are then choosing to go outside of our school district. We have some of the best teachers in the state in the Dacton. Um, my daughter's teacher was here. She left. She was here earlier tonight. Um, and I just know that my daughter's getting an excellent education. I do fear 
that if we start talking about school closures and even talking about moving kids into different schools and different configurations, that is going to have an effect on the educators in our district. Uh, and I don't want us to lose sight of that. We want to keep the best here in this district and do everything we can to keep them here. Um, so I just am I'm assured after hearing from a lot of you that next week you do want to vote on this and that you are in the mindset of keeping Arrowhead open, but I just want to really urge you all to do that next week. Have that, have the, um, the vote go through, listen to all the evidence that was provided tonight, to Dr. Shirley's recommendations, all the public feedback, and vote next week to keep Arrowhead open. Thank you. Jen Subert, thank you, Lower Providence Township. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zerby, for this analysis tonight. I think so far it's been the most clear and digestible to date of the capacity data. Um, as you know, I, I am one of the Arrowhead Home School presidents, and I want to thank you for the resolution and hopefully allowing us to move forward with planning for next year. There's been a lot of questions and things that we can answer until hopefully this resolution goes through. Um, I just want to give you guys a little advice. If you don't want to peek, um, want to repeat the mistakes of past boards, I think the talk about selling or donating Audubon is very premature. Until you can say definitively or explain to the public why we can't use Audubon, um, if you're going towards the renovation or rebuilding phase of um, Arrowhead, it seems like right now we're left with two options, which would be to rebuild or um, renovate, which would lead to the, uh, like the displacement of Arrowhead students. Um, that would be inevitable that the current students will be displaced, and so and you right now you have a current empty elementary school um, that could be temporary temporarily used to house our students and staff. So if that can't be done, I would like that to be explained. I don't know how we're talking about selling our dinner right now when it's being empty, and we're talking about closing a school and having to displace those students. Um, we don't want to be put into trailers and divided into thirds into the three remaining schools during the process because that would result in another redistricting of students that have already been redistricted to Arrowhead two years ago. Um, it's a lot of, still a lot of um, adjustment and transition. So keeping our community together during this renovation and rebuild is very important. Um, I'd also like to throw out an option G just to complicate things. Um, but if you are going to be renovating or rebuilding, um, if you could add possibly an additional eight to 10 classrooms, that would just be for full day kindergarten as part of Arrowhead. Um, it's already in the construction costs. You wouldn't have to then add on onto the other three existing buildings if there's additional costs. I believe maybe it would help some of the yellow and red that you had on option A's slide. I'm not a big fan of option F because I'm opposed to a six, seven, eight Arcola. Um, Phoenixville Area School District had a case center for years and years and years. They now have PALC, it's called the Phoenixville Area Early Learning Center. It's a kindergarten and first grade student. It's kindergarten and first grade for the entire district. And the rest of their remaining elementary schools are, K are two through five. Um, so it's being done, it's a wonderful building. They've actually closed one of their oldest elementary schools and they um, built Manabon and PALC together and they have a shared library and um, it's a beautiful building, but um, I just, you don't need a whole case center if it's just eight or 10 classes, but maybe adding it on to the construction costs. The main complaint would probably be transportation across the districts, but um, of everyone having to come to Arrowhead for kindergarten, but hopefully that will be muffled with the happiness that everyone just got free full day kindergarten. As um, someone who paid for both their children to attend a full day private kindergarten, it's very expensive. Um, so just wanted to throw that out there. So thank you again for the resolution and for hopefully bringing some peace of mind to our Arrowhead community. Thank you. Hello, my name is Erin Ranieri. I uh, live in Lower Providence, and I have two children that attend Arrowhead. Um, and I've been teaching right down the hallway in the high school here for many, many years. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you to the board members. Being on the school board is not an easy task, especially when you have very big decisions to make. Um, I'm confident that you will make an informed decision based off of the discussions and questions that you have posed at the previous meetings um, I've attended. I'd also like to apologize on behalf of um, a lot of my fellow residents for the poor behavior during some of the public comment. <clears throat> I think that you are uh, spoken to in a very inappropriate way sometimes, um, bordering on the line of harassment. 
um, to those community members that choose to speak in that tone. I think that um, <clears throat> we would all like to hear the information that, that you're bringing forth, uh, but, but without the blatant disrespect to you all. Um, when you speak harshly as you do, your point is really not getting across to the community. In fact, I know many of us just sit and cringe in our seats rather than actually hearing the things that you are saying. Uh, in keeping with my point, I've uh, worked in the district for 17 years. This is an excellent district. I moved my family to this district to have the experience of it. Uh, we have an amazing staff, amazing families in this district. We have well-rounded, intelligent individuals that are going out in the workforce and are very successful in the real world. I keep in touch with many, many previous students. Um, and believe me when I say that they are doing excellent things. Um, I'd like our district to stay that way and uh, if not improve um, in focusing on long-term goals. Our district needs to be making proactive decisions rather than reactive decisions and really looking at the future, not just the near future. In doing so, I feel that there is um, no other answer as um, but to rebuild our head. I think our district uh, needs to be attractive to young families that are looking for their forever homes. I want to be able to fulfill the full day kindergarten and be as attractive as some of our other districts in Montgomery County. Um, I'm proud of this district and I, you know, I want to be proud of the facilities, uh, not just the people in it. Um, I think renovating is not the answer. I think the money that you will put into renovating um, will not be as well spent as money um, that you would rebuilding. Um, there are many benefits to having smaller elementary communities um, in keeping um, the four buildings open, which I'm happy to hear that uh, we have the resolution coming, hopefully, um, at the next meeting. Having three um, is not the move that the district wants to make. I think that one of the most important factors of elementary buildings is that the teachers, the counselors, the nurses, the staff, um, and the administrators are all very familiar with the families that live in their um, elementary areas. And um, they know students on a very personal level. I think in these early years is where uh, it's crucial to identify students with special needs, whether it be academic, behavioral, or gifted. And I think that having too many students in one building will allow too many students to fall through the cracks. Um, at one of the November meetings, and tonight I was very happy to hear the conversation that the board was having and the questioning, questions that you guys have been asking. Um, I do think we need to move forward with full day kindergarten. Um, there's many, many special ed laws that uh, need more space in the buildings, um, and I think we need to keep that space open. There's new programs that you've talked about running that I think are important, and there is numerous homes being built in the district, so I'm glad to hear that um, it sounds like we are not going to be closing Arrowhead. Um, I'm sorry, Mrs. Ringer, I have to That's okay, that's right okay, off. that's okay. Um, just, as I said before, I do have two students at Arrowhead. I, I'm looking at this more so as a high school teacher and a community member, and I'm trying not to, you know, just focus on my own two children. I don't think they're gonna benefit from the new building, to be honest with you. I think they're gonna be out of there by the time that, um, it would be built or, or renovated. Um, but I want to focus on having good class sizes and the awesome community feeling that we currently have in our elementary schools. And I want to be an attractive district in Montgomery County and the most attractive district, not just one of the top. I think we should strive to be the best. Thank you. Jim Mallard, Worcester. You know, one thing uh, I learned as a uh, speaker is we, we don't uh, attack people in the public when we speak. So I try to keep that in mind when I'm up here because you guys signed up for your job as public servants. So, you know, we kind of try to keep our comments to you guys. 
So I'm surprised <clears throat> that members of the public think you guys are actually going to vote against, you know, you're going to vote to close uh, our area. They don't obviously know you guys. There's not, there's zero percent chance that you're going to close our area. And I'll take a bet with anybody. You're not going to close our head. I'll bet my life on it. Okay? So, I, you know, I'm surprised people don't realize that. You're not going to close our head. No way on God's earth. Um, with um, regards to Dr. Zerby's presentation tonight, why couldn't that get presented to us in November? That would have been the right way to do it. Present that, let the public digest it, and make our comments. Why can't we do it that way? Any reason? Dr. Malik, I'll break with my usual policy here and just say that a, a lot of what came out of that presentation was questions that were raised in November. Well, we, we got nothing in November. We've had nothing all along. It's kind of a travesty. Um, as far as your concern for the taxpayers, um, you know, I know you're concerned about us. You're going to be concerned enough to send a mailer out to the general public and tell everybody about the $14 million you're going to spend? Please send a mailer to every taxpayer and tell us about the $14 million you're going to spend. I'll bet you'll get some feedback. You know, you didn't get any feedback, you know, about uh, the project because nobody knew about it. I went through all of the 460 pages too, Ms. Drummond. Well, you know, 90% came back pro-project. Well, 90% of those people were Arrowhead people. Well, that's what happens when you don't tell the public what's going on. You, you guys all forgot about that piece. Um, Dr. Zerby relies entirely on Milo and the Grimm study. Now, why did you put the five to ten year projections in when you can't rely on them in your presentation? Any reason? Can't rely on them. They're unreliable when you put them in your study. I did a right to know request for the backup data from Milo and McBroom. They wouldn't give it to me. So what I did is I went to Worcester Township and asked them what information they gave Milo and McBroom on housing data. They didn't give them any. They gave them the 485 old data, not the new data. So how do they come to the conclusion about the pipeline study with old data and not the new data? How do they figure out to do, and to do the enrollment stuff? They don't have the new data. How did you come up with your, da your, your data, Dr. Zerby? With, how, how did this all come about? M&M gave, gave you numbers that can't be relied upon. Where did they get the figures from? Can you, can you tell me? Dr. Malik, you know questions are supposed to be directed at me. Well, he's the one putting on the show. Eminem, I checked with Worcester. They don't have any information that they gave him. So where did they get it? I went through the, the information that Che gave me, and Che, and they don't, you guys didn't give Eminem any information. Dr. Malik, please wrap up. I know. So where's this show coming from? Five to ten year daddy can't rely on. Eminem doesn't have information. What is this show? Dr. Mello, please wrap up. I know. Well, Dr. Zerby? Dr. Mello, please take a seat. I, I got it. Anyone else for courtesy of the floor? Mr. Bickelman. Joe Bickelman from Audubon. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the Arrowhead issue because it's evident that you're not closing Arrowhead based on you're not supporting the closure of Arrowhead. I don't know what all the arguments were for. But all the arguments that you heard, 
Now you know how we're suffering in the Audubon community. Everything that they said would happen, that. If our eyes were closed, that's how we're suffering in Audubon. Okay? All that business, longer bus rides, you know, market value, uh, parent involvement. Audubon closed, so that's how we're suffering. Um, I just want to commend uh, Mr. Bricker for his uh, work on the budget, the accounting systems, the uh, uh, it makes me cringe to hear the things that you're saying. We're charging an expense somewhere because that's where it's budgeted. Uh, you're straight out a big mess that's been going on for a long time. Uh, you're the best business manager that this district ever had. And you come from a, a private uh, industry background in banking and you've learned a lot uh, over the short time and it's very impressive. And uh, I know you're working hard and spending a lot of hours. Uh, I go to all the meetings, I go to all the finance committee meetings and the last finance committee meeting, Mr. Bricker spoke of uh, the activity funds at the fact in high school. I believe he said there was, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, about 60 clubs that have balances with no activity for three to seven years. There are balances in these clubs. They're not really clubs because they don't have all the criteria to meet the club uh, definition. But for three to seven years, there are 60 clubs in the Methacton High School that don't have any activity. One that stuck out was a club with a $14,000 balance that no one is paying attention, man, maybe somebody is, that nobody is paying attention to, okay? The $14,000 was raised for local, to be given to local charities, I believe it's called Angel something, Angel, has an angel in the name, but it's a balance of $14,000 that no one's paying attention to. I believe Mr. Speedwack is in charge of the review of the activity funds. 60 accounts, no activity for three to seven years, and one club has a balance of $14,000. If the kids, the officers that are in charge of that club, the president, the treasurer, secretary, the kids, and the sponsor, a teacher sponsor, and Mr. Speedwack paying attention to that listing of accounts, that $14,000 would be distributed to the local needs of the community that it was raised for. So I don't know why those activity funds are sitting there like that. The balances that had no activity. $14,000 just sitting in a high school club account. No one's paying attention to that? Hmm. I wonder. Somebody's paying attention to it. Uh, I heard tonight that salary and benefits are 68% of the budget. This is the first year the board is getting staffing data. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Earnshaw, for getting the staffing data. 68% of the budget. And that's after a comment from the superintendent in prior meetings. We have 36 excess teachers we don't need. I hope, Mr. Earnshaw, you get from this gentleman, Shay Regina, the amount of teachers that are budgeted in the budget, not the actual staff listing, because there are people in the budget that we're not going to use for anything. Mr. So get to the bottom of that and the excess teachers and the low enrollment classes and on and on. Okay? But nice job, Mr. Bricker. Let's get the activity funds straightened out at the high school. Let's get the kids involved in getting that $14,000 distributed to the local charities. Thank you, Mr. Bickelman. Anyone else for further silver floor? I have a motion to adjourn. Seeing okay. multiple the meeting adjourned.